Hi, welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Meg King, Director of the Science and Technology Innovation Program, which analyzes and translates how emerging technologies will impact international relations from artificial intelligence to 5G and offers policymakers and the public tools to understand advancements in science and technology in experiential ways through training programs, citizen science, and serious games. Semiconductors are the major ingredient for most of the technologies we use today and for those we hope to use and develop tomorrow. Today, in partnership with the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, or CITRUS, at the University of California, Berkeley, we offer you the chance to take a deep dive into this industry to learn why chips matter, why their supply chain is so complex, what security issues they present, and what policymakers can do about it. There are already efforts underway in Congress and by President Biden to address this challenge, but in arguably one of the most globally interconnected manufacturing industries in the world, government can't solve these problems alone. As if this technology wasn't complex enough, geopolitics overlays each of the issues we'll discuss today. For example, China has just released a draft of its 14th five-year plan that reportedly addresses the need to reduce the country's vulnerability to external forces in science and technology, especially in production, distribution, and use of integrated circuits or chips. It's not a coincidence that our secretaries of state and defense just announced a first trip to South Korea and Japan. The Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the U.S. Director Robert Daly and Program Associate Ray Zong are with us today and hopefully can share their perspective on the new five-year plan during our Q&A session later. Please to those of you in our audience send questions to stip, stip at wilsoncenter.org or tweet at Wilson STIP. Today's event is the brainchild of Wilson Center Public Policy Fellow Dr. Melissa Griffith who will moderate our second panel on security issues. Dr. John Zeisman, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley, and co-founder of the Berkeley Roundtable on the International Economy, will moderate our first panel on competition in a global market. But first, former DARPA Director and Citrus Senior Advisor, Dr. Victoria Coleman will deliver a keynote to shape the conversation. Dr. Costa Spanos, Citrus Director, and Andrew Grove Distinguished Professor will give a few remarks about our collaboration and introduce Dr. Coleman. Welcome, Dr. Spanos. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. My name is Costa Spanos. I'm Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at UC Berkeley and the Director of Citrus and the Banato Institute. Uh, we are a research organization that for the past 20 years has been working with hundreds of faculty, students, researchers and affiliated corporations and philanthropies across four UC campuses focusing on information technologies with profound societal impact. I would like to thank the Wilson Sentinel and all the collaborators for organizing this event. To those of us who have been working in this area for years, the subject and its timing is crucial. Myself, having spent most of my career in an orbit around the Silicon Valley, I think it's important to remind ourselves that without the Silicon, this would still be a lovely place, but it would just be a valley. So over the years, uh, as humanity taught itself how to create and use semiconductors, uh, this was an amazing process that we refer to as Moore's law. We saw exponential growth of technologies, the emergence of a half a trillion dollar market and profound impact in our lives. And it all started here in the Silicon Valley. But today, this is an undeniably global phenomenon and its geographic center of gravity is much more diffuse. However, claiming a position of leadership in these technologies is more than the pure joy of discovery and the promise of local prosperity. As it was mentioned already, today, uh, information technology leadership rests squarely in the critical path of not only amazing applications that can and have made our lives better, but also of huge regional, national, and global geopolitical interests. So humanity has still a lot to learn about harnessing the potential of these technologies. For the last decade, if not more, Moore's law has been much more than just about making things smaller and cheaper. And there is so much more to imagine, discover, invent, develop, design, and manufacture. Do we care about where the new epicenter will be and uh, how it would look like? And if we do, what can we do about it? I hope that today's discussion will shed some light in these important questions, and I can think of no better person to get us started than Dr. Victoria Coleman. Dr. Coleman uh, is the former director of DARPA, and she currently serves as a senior advisor at Citrus, 
at UC Berkeley, where she's leading microelectronics technology policy. Prior to DARPA, she served as a CEO of Atlas AI, a Silicon Valley startup that brings world-class AI solutions to sustainable, to sustainable development. Prior to that, she was, she was the CTO at the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit that supports Wikipedia. Uh, she also served in many leadership positions across the industry as a senior vice president at Technicolor for, and CTO for the Connected Home Business, senior vice president for R&D for Harman's infotainment division, vice president of engineering at Yahoo, vice president at Nokia's imaging platforms, Vice President for Software Engineering at HP Palm Business Unit, Vice President with Samsung's Advanced Institute of Technology. She has served as, a, as Intel D Director for Security Initiatives. And prior to that, she joined SRI International in 1998 after serving for 10 years as a tenured professor in the University of London. She became the founding director of SRI's System Design Laboratory in 1999. She was the member of the Defense Science Board, board a member and founding chair of DARPA's Microsystems Exploratory Council, a member of Lockheed Martin's Technology Advisory Group, a member of Airbus Industry Star Board, a member of Santa Clara's University Advisory Board for the Department of Computer Engineering, and she has also served on the board of directors at the Public Library of Science. Dr. Coleman, I'm looking forward to your remarks this morning. Uh -huh. Thank you, uh, Costas. Um, thank you um, to the Wilson Center, to, uh, to, to Sophie and Melissa for um, giving me the opportunity to, today to share some remarks. Um, hopefully to kickstart the conversation. Um, they, so, you know, I, uh, I just wanna light some fires and see how our panel, uh, our panels today will, um, will uh, respond to those topics. Um, I think all of us are here today because we care deeply about uh, leadership uh, for our nation, for microelectronics. So I wanted to share some thoughts about where we find ourselves and perhaps some thoughts about um, how we could move forward. Next slide, please. So many of you will have seen uh, this, uh, this, this um, graph. Uh, it's something that concentrates the mind. Uh, if you look where we are in uh, 2020, the United States has 12% of global manufacturing capacity. Uh, the numbers that you see here are in um, thousands of wafer starts per month. Um, and as you see steady state, if we do nothing by 2030, um, our share of global manufacturing capacity will have gone down to 9%. Um, the question is whether this is good enough uh, or whether we need to um, we need to do something different. Um, next slide, please. Many people, you will hear many people, many of us today will speak about um, either claiming, reclaiming or restoring or um, sustaining our US leadership in microelectronics. Um, what does it mean? Um, I think it's really fundamental for us to decide what it means. Um, and I would say um, reversal of this trend that we just, uh, we just talked about would be um, desirable. Um, in other words, how would you know if we now have leadership? What are the things that you would be looking at? So this reversal of the trend is certainly very important, um, but also world-class technology will be discovered, developed and scaled by US space companies. And we'll get back to the scaling um, in, uh, in a little while in these remarks. Um, there would be highly profitable and sustainable business models. So there will be a thriving, diverse research community. We will have the world's best people working on these problems here, uh, here at home. Um, and last but not least, and this is really important uh, to always keep in mind, um, we would have availability of reasonably priced, affordable, performant, and trustworthy microelectronics components for the Department of Defense mission. Um, so this is what it means to me. It probably means different things to different people. Um, what really matters is that we need a national semiconductor strategy that has quantifiable objectives. So I'm sure that many of you have followed the legislation last summer, um, which became the CHIPS Act. The CHIPS Act contains 
uh, a great deal of ideas, initiatives, forward thinking um, about improving our, uh, our status in the world, if you like, when it comes to microelectronics. But what it lacks um, is this strategy. It actually asks um, the executive branch to create the strategy, and I couldn't agree more with that. Next slide, please. So how did we get here? You know, it's, if you're gonna get yourself out of the hole, um, probably you need to know how you got there in the first place. And uh, uh, Costas mentioned this already. Um, the semiconductor industry, as we know today, was really built on Moore's law. Uh, what Moore's law did, it shifted the focus um, of attention from improving the characteristics of a, a single device to increasing density. In other words, as you know, stop worrying about the individual transistor, how well that behaved, but we focused on packing ever more uh, greater numbers of transistors in the same area. Now, the problem with this is that Moore's law is not a law at all. Uh, it's actually a business model. The law that underlines Moore's law uh, is built on something called the NART scaling after a scientist at IBM. Uh, who observed that um, back in 1975, that as transistors get smaller, they can switch faster and use less power. And what that really means is that with every technology generation, if the transistor density doubles, the circuit becomes faster and power consumption stays the same. So talk about a free lunch. <laughs> so the not scaling meant that manufacturers could drastically increase clock frequencies from one generation to the next, without significantly increasing overall power consumption. So what this means is if you have a design that is performant and you're able to shrink it, now all you need to do is clock it up and it performs so much better than the previous design. So no design innovation is needed. It was all about process. Next slide, please. However, the free lunch doesn't last forever. In fact, this free lunch stopped uh, being free <laughs> uh, in the early 2000s as this graph here shows you. So there comes a point where the, the physics no longer work, um, which means that now in order to um, continue um, um, packing more and more devices and make them smaller and smaller, in these this small geometries, um, things like current, current leakage and thermal effects are much greater challenges. So what, what happened is there they came an abrupt, pretty abrupt plateau in microprocessor frequency as the free lunch. So when that happened, um, various companies started having to innovate uh, to create competitive advantage. Because up, up to this point, the basis of competitive advantage in industry was your ability to shrink. Well, now that didn't work anymore. So now we had to find different ways of, of, uh, of improving performance generation after generation. Um, in the company that I worked in um, at, at Intel, you know, we, um, We've developed multi-core as did many other companies. We also developed technologies that were called star T's. And these were technologies that, you know, would improve performance of the microprocessor or the system overall in specific categories. Um, what really all this meant though, is um, it became really much more difficult to innovate uh, in this space. Um, in, in the era, you know, post uh, 2000, um, people started talking about equivalent scaling. So what we wanted to do now that we couldn't shrink devices anymore for free, we wanted to develop enough innovation on the side to still have the same effect so that it looked like Moore's law was still alive, right? Um, so I think it's important to realize that um, you know, the fear about Moore's law failing, um, actually that's kind of started 20 years ago. That, that's not something that um, we, um, but that is new, a new challenge for us. And you know, so far, I think it's fair to say that despite all the challenges that we've had, interest by and large has been able to make the investments to keep ahead. But um, there are consequences. Next slide, please. As this progress became more and more expensive, the R&D the, the, the R &D costs that uh, you needed to apply to stay ahead also grew considerably. And that had implications. Um, the, um, the total number of IDMs, and IDM is, is an integrated device manufacturer like Intel that both designs and manufactures um, systems, 
dropped from 29 in 2001 to 8 for 2015. In other words, competition on the basis of design became a challenge for many, many companies that actually exited the business. At the same time, because of that, venture capital started to dry up. So in 2003, for example, we had 44 companies that were founded, that were funded uh, to work in semiconductors. Um, in contrast, between 2007 and 2011, we only had 36 uh, such companies. So basically, the worsening economics uh, caused a, um, a collapse of part of the industry. Uh, it also, unfortunately, caused a fracture. The collaborative research ecosystem that the industry had uh, developed over decades to allow it to stay ahead. Next slide, please. And I'm going to show you, um, you know, with, with numbers, really, why, uh, well, how, what that looked like. And, and here are a couple of things to observe. Um, first of all, the, um, the cost of staying in business continued to grow. And you can see from 1980 through 2014, how, for example, Intel's R&D expenditures had to grow to stay in business. This is a very expensive business, and it got really very expensive once the NARD scaling stop working. Um, and that almost, you know, um, matches, you know, uh, like the two continents that separate, if you look at these graphs, you see what happened to the SRC membership. SRC is the Semiconductor Research Consortium, which was one of the key um, um, kind of instruments of collaboration in, in, in industry, where they would come together, they would create the roadmap, and they would all um, work towards um, uh, delivering it. So companies going out of business because competitive advantage has shifted, it became very expensive. At the same time, now that you know, it wasn't just about um, uh, shrinking, now you know, I as Intel didn't wanna share my ideas with AMD or others. So now we have fragmentation in the ecosystem that raised all boats, if you like. Next slide, please. So does this matter? Um, you know, we went from, you know, we, we, we lost most of the IDMs that we have now. There's one left in this country. Um, doesn't matter. Um, I believe that it matters. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It is, I think it's an existential threat uh, to um, the semiconductor industry presence here at, at home. Um, you know, there is a school of thought that says, you know, so long as you keep design here at home, like what is typically called stage one, research and design, it doesn't matter if stage two and stage three, uh, front end fabrication and then uh, back end assembly test and packaging, if those things go overseas, it doesn't matter because we can still uh, do research and design here. However, um, this is another case where there's no free lunch. Um, if we let uh, stages two and three go, um, you are really walking into a national, what I call it, national de-skilling that one day soon will preclude the US from even participating in research um, and design. Next slide, please. And if you don't believe me, uh, maybe you believe on the growth. <laughs> um, you used to call himself a one-time factory guy. Uh, this is a quote from a Business Week article he wrote in 2010. Uh, he said, without scaling, we don't just lose jobs, we'll lose our hold on new technologies. Losing the ability to scale will ultimately damage our capacity to innovate. Um, I have over the years taken this to heart. I believe we as a nation need to take this to heart. We need to put scaling uh, alongside um, innovation in the heart of, uh, of what we do. Next slide, Next slide please. Um, well, what does it really mean? Well, um, in my mind, it means that we we'll have to rebuild our microelectronics industrial commons. You know, if we look back at what Semitech, for example, was able to do um, to reverse the uh, losing market share to the Japanese of a RAM, um, DRAM, you know, back in the day, I strongly believe that we can do the same thing now. Uh, again, next slide, please. Um, Scaling, how do, we, how do we get there? Uh, what, do, what, what, what can we do in common? What, what can we do so that we centralize uh, expensive parts of this process and um, 
share them so that, again, we begin to raise all boats. And there are two areas that I would like to, uh, just to um, you know, leave with you today. Um, there may be others. One is that uh, we need commons to support turning research into scalable innovation. And I wanna say a few more things about that before uh, concluding my remarks. And the other one is to enable technology sharing to create a domestic microelectronics ecosystem and supply chain. You know, one day we should be able to make an iPhone here domestically. I mean, if, if, if somebody, um, you know, if somebody wanted to put forward the grand challenge of what it would take to build an iPhone here domestically one day, I think we will begin to understand in great crisp detail what commons we will need to enable to make the second thing happen. Um, next slide, please. So, um, you know, Costas, many, others, uh, many other researchers are busy producing um, many candidates that will take us beyond CMOS uh, and therefore, you know, free us from the NARD scaling uh, jail. Um, the trouble is they're all unproven. Next slide, please. In order to, um, in order to um, bridge the gap between what is uh, developed in the lab and what is needed in order to make the investment to build a fab, we have a, a so-called value of death. Um, it's impossible to, to, to take um, an innovation, for example, that you know, maybe, you, you know, like at Berkeley, um, you know, Sue J. King developed FinFets. So taking that and going to an Intel and saying, you know, build a fab for $20 billion to, uh, to manufacture these things, um, just not gonna happen. You need, you need an intermediate step where you can show that actually, if you scale this innovation, it will deliver the advantage that you want. So that part is missing. Um, and myself, um, you know, um, the, you know the, the, the Congress, luckily enough, also saw and rec recognized the need for this. It's uh, Microelectronics Commons is envisioned as part of the CHIPS legislation. I very much hope that we will be able uh, to um, develop, to design, to execute something like this. Um, since we are running a long time, if you could go to the very last slide, please, uh, Sophie. Next one. Perfect. Uh, oopsie. So if you uh, just go back one slide. Well, maybe not. It doesn't matter. So I just wanted to, um, to talk for a moment about um, what it would take to create a, uh, a national um, uh, a national plan. Um, we need leadership to drive it. Um, who's going to do it? Uh, we need strategy to establish the goals. We need policy to enable those goals. And then we need, of course, execution to realize the goals. Um, we have a, luckily, we have a number of levers at our disposal. We have R&D, we have incredible R&D institutions. Um, we also need investment. Um, you know, we talked about venture capital drying up. We need to reverse that trend. Uh, incentives, um, you, we know that many of our, our competitors uh, overseas are uh, applying incentives that um, make it difficult for domestic companies here in the United States to compete effectively. Uh, we need to think about regulation, uh, too much or too little. And finally, we need to build alliances. This is, we don't have to go it alone. Uh, we can work with our uh, allies in, in Europe and other places um, in order again to collectively restore uh, leadership for uh, the United States in this critical area. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I hope uh, um, the remarks will help the panels uh, uh, have a, uh, a spirited discussion and I look forward to hearing that myself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about and uh, at the Wilson Center, we very much value the suggestion for both the need for a strategy around an entire um, sector and industry and um, the suggestion about a commons, which is something that we do spend a lot of research um, time on. So thank you. We'll now turn to our next two panels. The first, uh, competing in a global market that will be moderated by Dr. John Zeisman, Professor Emeritus in the Department of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley, and co-founder of the Berkeley Roundtable on the International Economy, a program within Citrus. And the second panel will be moderated by the Wilson Center's Public Policy Fellow, Dr. Melissa Griffith, 
Um, and the title of that panel is Mitigating National Security Concerns. I'll let each moderator introduce their panels and take it away as we have such short time. Thank you so much, Dr. Zeisman. Dr. Zeisman? There we go. My apologies for that. Um, I will start again. Thanks, Meg. Uh, as we start, may I emphasize that despite the virtual distance, we look forward to the participation of all. And questions should be emailed or tweeted to STIP, uh, emailed at STIP, S-T-I-P, at wilsoncenter.org, or Twittered to uh, at Wilson STIP. Uh, our purpose in this first session is to advance our understanding of the semiconductor industry for discussion its importance to the broader economy and the issues that confront firms and policymakers. We have three fabulous panelists and I will do fairly short introductions uh, before we turn to the questions. Uh, Susie Armstrong is Senior Vice President of Engineering and has been with Qualcomm for more than 26 years. She is, I should say, the reason that our phones can connect to the internet and she led Qualcomm's software and customer engineering, engineering team for many years. Susie joined the government affairs team in 2015 and currently supports global public policy, including intellectual property, STEM and STEM diversity issues. Uh, Vladimir Bulovic is a professor at MIT and director of the MIT Nano Lab and the founder of several companies, including Ubiquitous, Kativa and QD Vision. And some of his inventions are in many of the newest televisions uh, that you may be considering buying. Ajit Manoka, is the president and CEO of SEMI, which is the global industry association serving the electronics manufacturing and design supply chain. He was at formerly the CEO at Global Foundries and held senior positions and roles at companies like Spansion and Philips Semiconductors. He served on the president's committee for advanced manufacturing partnership and was part of PCAS, the president's council of advisors on science and technology. We're going to break our discussion around two themes. First, the centrality and availability of chips, and secondly, sustaining innovation and competitive leadership. So let's turn to the first of those. There has recently in the press been a focus both on chip shortages and the emergence of TSMC in Taiwan and Samsung in Korea as advanced producers challenging American uh, production leadership. So let's start, uh, Ajit, if we could, with, uh, with a question to you. Uh, does the recent shortage of chips for the automobile industry, which is slowing production of cars around the world, um, indicate something about the importance of uh, chips to the old economy? Uh, indeed, we could note that auto sector stocks have dipped as chip stocks surge, just as the value added from electronics in the car has risen. So again, what does this tell us about the importance of chips to the overall economy? Over to you, Ajit. Thank you, John. And first of all, before I get to the to the point that you asked me to talk about, I really like to, to echo and uh, uh, and uh, thank uh, Dr. Victoria Campbell for her keynote speech. She was wonderful. She was spot on. In fact, my recommendation is in order to address all the issues that uh, uh, this panel is trying to address, she should join uh, President Biden's uh, uh, executive team. And I will provide the semi uh, industry wise through semi to, to Dr. Victoria Kemp and Coleman. I mean, she was just spot on. I think she has summed it up in the best way I have heard in 40 years of my career in the industry. Well, coming back to the importance of the semiconductors. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, people did not really appreciate semiconductors for many years. And we take semiconductors for granted all the time. And if you ask a lot of uh, students uh, about the semiconductor companies, they don't really give a hoot about semiconductor companies. They all believe that they want to go work for Google, Facebook, and Amazon, but they don't realize that without semiconductors, these companies would not exist. And, uh, but last year, I think made a major turning point in the importance, both strategic importance and national importance uh, for economic and societal benefits that this, because of pandemic, uh, probably the painful way to, uh, to start appreciating the importance of semiconductors. I think last year, it really made it very clear that semiconductors have provided the foundation for our modern digital infrastructure. 
I mean, in COVID-19, networking and computing for working from home has become the new norm. I mean, a lot of companies were keeping their essential business uh, uh, running and a lot of monitoring was done remote. And again, telehealth used to be less than 5% until 2019. And 2020, we've gone up to 70 plus percent and it's rising. And I think the most important uh, uh, thing that which happened, people are wondering how come we got the vaccine rolled out so soon in less than a year, not one company, three companies in US. And people didn't, don't realize that behind this success is the role of semiconductors. In the genome sequencing, it takes years to do the sequencing. But thanks to the semiconductors enabled innovations uh, for supercomputing, they were able to do this genome sequencing in weeks. Hence, we have vaccines in less than a year. And this is really the major, major breakthrough that people should understand the semiconductors are super important to the industry, uh, to, to the country. But I think is somehow I feel that we were sleeping on the job in US. And I think uh, Dr. Victoria Coleman uh, mentioned it very clearly that other countries have progressed. She talked about the, the, the wafer capacity has gone down from 50% in early years to 12% and it's gonna go down to 9%. So I think these are a the lot of, uh, a lot of messages here that we need to really to, to, to work on. Now, you talked about the shortage. I think the pandemic really made it important that we provide all the support for infrastructure because I, I mentioned about the working from home, uh, the homeschooling. I mean, I have three grandkids in the ages of three to six. I mean, I could not imagine that each one of them have their own laptop or iPad or or notepad, you know, and that's the needed for the homeschooling. So imagine that the demand for the these devices is through the roof. Today, many governments have the the backlog of the orders for computers. Uh, it's really it's difficult to fill, and also data centers because social media activities have grown up quite a bit because of the working from home or networking. Uh, so the demand for data center chips is go through the roof. So what happened when pandemic started? The, some of the companies which were not actually enjoying the growth and they started going downhill, including automotive, they started canceling the orders. But the, the chip makers had to really prioritize the demand which was supporting the pandemic. And so the, the people who canceled their orders, they got in, back in the line. And now every single fab in the world is running full capacity. It's a very rare situation but it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a good problem to have, but a very painful problem uh, for, for many companies. So I think this is a, a pandemic induced shortage, but at the same time, the, the semiconductors, and this is what I'm trying to address the point on the importance of semiconductors. It has, in, it has in, enabled so many new disruptions that demand for semiconductors is going through the roof. We are 450 billion, say let's say half a trillion size industry today. It's going to double in next 10 years. It took us 60 years to come to half a trillion. In next 10 years, it's going to double to 1 trillion. So the demand for semiconductors is growing rapidly. And so, so, so it's, it's going to be a tight competition between capacity ramp up and fulfilling the needs of all the businesses. Thank you, Ajit. Um, Susie Armstrong, if I can turn to you, I'd love to have your thoughts on two aspects of this. One is what is your view on the cause of the shortage? Uh, I should say that as uh, Ajit has mentioned, there's a huge surge in several different dimensions uh, of the demand. And there's also been a change in the composition of that demand, I should say, uh, with the rise of chips that are implementing um, machine learning applications uh, becoming ever more important and changing the character of the chip. So maybe you could say something both about what it is the shortage and uh, its composition. And I know that one of the issues close to your heart and that of Qualcomm is design uh, and where the story of design um, capacity uh, fits into uh, the conversation we're having. Great, thank you, John. And um, I'd also like to, I'm gonna switch the order a little bit and talk about the design um, first. Uh, and I would also like to um, echo Ajit's comments about Dr. Coleman's comments. 
Um, I think Dr. Coleman, uh, you know, is spot on, should be a member of that Biden team and uh, really set the stage for us here. Because uh, one thing that I, I think we don't want to have lost in the policy discussion is there's appropriate, absolutely appropriate concern about uh, manufacturing capability um, uh, by allies or on, on US soil. But without the design and without the R&D that feeds that manufacturing capability, you don't, you don't have anything to manufacture. And so the, the R&D that goes into both the design, specific design of semiconductors, the research in how they're made, the, um, the upfront research in the technologies that are driven by semiconductors is extremely critical to the US. And the US currently has leadership in, in these areas. And we can see this by, you know, China's um, trying to catch up. And uh, it's, uh, you know, to us, leadership in R&D is something that the US has a strong, um, a, a strong advantage in right now. Um, but it's ours to lose. And we need to make sure in the conversations, you know, with the CHIPS Act and with the legislation and with the conversations with the Biden administration that we make sure that we maintain those policy, policies, maintain and enhance those policies that have given us that, that leadership. Um, strong R&D funding in universities and labs, uh, access for US companies to global markets, you know, that's how we actually fund our R&D. Um, avoiding unintended consequences of, of trade and export policies and um, building, and I think um, Dr. Coleman mentioned this in, as well, building those um, multilateral uh, alliances with other like-minded uh, uh, countries. Um, to your point about uh, the semiconductor shortage and what is driving it, I think um, Ajit's comments were, were also spot on and we've seen a lot of um, press around uh, the, the automotive dy dynamic and, and the pandemic, et cetera. But we believe this is, and I believe this is far beyond a pandemic problem. The, the semiconductor industry um, is being driven by demand and with the digital transformation, you know, everything with the data centers, with the machine learning, every, all of that, with the sensors that, you know, sense, you know, water in your, in your field so you can fine tune, you know, your crop watering. Everything is being driven by semiconductor. So we believe this is not, you know, a two quarter automotive industry issue or a, you know, a, heaven forbid, another year of a pandemic issue. I think those, those things were, were just harbingers of what the kind of demand that is, is to come. And so that shortage I think is critical to start addressing um, now, because if we are going to be looking at, you know, building uh, complex fabs on US soil um, or in allied, we have to start now. It takes a tremendous amount of um, time and energy and investment between design companies and the fabrication companies to actually um, pull that off at um, at uh, uh, any sort of um, you know cost effective and um, yield uh, time scales. And the other point I, I wanted to make very quickly is um, there's semiconductors and there's semiconductors. <laughs> um, there's uh, you know there's a lot of discussion about leading node you know five nanometer semiconductors. But if you look in an automobile, there's probably 3,500 to 7,000 uh, uh, chips in an automobile. Not all of those are, you know, five nanometer, uh, you know, microelectronics that are driving the brains uh, of the device. In a in a uh, cell phone, for example, is, which is an area we know very very well, there's 45 chips in in your cell phone. There's probably one at a leading leading edge node, you know, the chip that actually drives all the, pro the protocols and drives the display in the camera. But there are so many, there's, you know, 44 other sort of accessory chips and any one and lack of any one of those chips, whether it's memory or whether it's power management chips can gate the shipping of the whole chipset. 
And so I think it's really important to understand that the, the, for the US when, they're, when we're looking at building uh, fabs and, and addressing these shortages that we look not only at uh, leading node uh, technologies, but we also look at uh, uh, mature technologies and technologies that are, are used to build some, some of these auxiliary or accessory chipsets. Before I turn to Vladimir, I would want to emphasize something that you've just uh, said, Susie, which is that there are uh, these two dimensions. There's leading edge uh, production capacities uh, and how do we maintain that and how do we assure sufficient capacity for, let's call them ordinary, more mature chips. Uh, with an important question being which of uh, those need to be on American soil, which of those need to be controlled by American firms. That's both a business decision um, and a uh, national strategy decision. Uh, we need to at least acknowledge that the strategy aspect of that uh, will come back up uh, in the second panel uh, that uh, Melissa is moderating. Uh, so if I can turn uh, to you, Vladimir, uh, and we have already heard that TSMC and Samsung are challenging Intel for production leadership if they haven't already overtaken Intel. Um, and what uh, we've heard, I'd love your views on how that's posing a problem. Uh, do we need five nanometer foundries or should we count on TSMC and Samsung uh, to produce chips that companies uh, like Qualcomm have designed or companies that you've built have designed? Uh, and both TSMC and Samsung are willing to make chips that other designs, of course, while Intel, uh, while still something of a production leader, only makes chips for itself. Uh, it's a complex situation, both as a business matter and as a national policy matter. So, Vladimir, your views. Well, John, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I will echo um, my colleague's statements about Victoria's uh, speech. I very, very much resonate with uh, every aspect that has been uh, indeed stated in her speech. And I would love to add a few extra things I think that are really important to highlight. Um, the reason why we don't need five nanometer technology from the business perspective in the United States is because the present leading companies uh, like Apple, like Qualcomm, uh, choose to go outside the United States and they can get their business needs met through our partners at TSMC and Samsung. So from making a business decision, uh, this is a very straightforward and it's already shown you know, by our choices uh, by the dominant companies of the United States. The question really is, uh, is there uh, anything that we need to be concerned about, and that indeed I will leave to the second panel when it comes to the national need. Uh, the other thing to highlight though is companies like Apple, let's say, they can build their own foundry for just from the spare cash they have lying around, if that would be a profitable business for them to be in. Chips might be just too inexpensive, right? And the value is in what surrounds the chip, the iPhone, right? Is uh, for as much as it truly depends on the operation of the chip, we know that, but we're not selling it at a price that indeed makes it profitable enough to run that business for companies like Apple that can make more profit, I would imagine, by choosing to just do the design. The big challenge, though, of that thinking is, at least from my perspective, is that Apple can design a technology that TSMC has available in their Lego box of available components, rather than rethinking what technology can be from scratch. Um, a good example would be, you know, billions and billions were invested in the making of silicon technology, but there is actually a way to make a higher mobility transistors using carbon nanotubes. It's futuristic. <laughs> it's futuristic to the point that we have said, well, this might not ever be scaled, but as of last year, there are now eight inch wafers made using carbon nanotube transistors, I believe at a 90 nanometer technology because that's the only ones available for us to test these integrated circuits, uh, large area integration of such carbon nanotubes. Getting the carbon nanotubes to be produced by a foundry over 12 inch wafers, I don't really know how to do that. <laughs> I don't really know whom to convince that they should invest 
a couple of billion dollars of new tool sets that will attach to the existing foundry, possibly spoil the production of the existing foundry because we haven't yet tested all of the materials interactions behind between the carbon nanotubes and the existing tool sets that are actually making money for the foundry. And as a result, we have a big challenge. This tremendous gap of invention, of innovation, we do have plenty of opportunities we right now are sitting on, and we have no bridge to actually allow us to go through the value of that, as Victoria pointed out. I think much more important, even above that, is asking, do we need it? Why isn't Apple, why isn't Qualcomm asking us uh, to make the next technology? Why aren't we looking at quantum computing as the thing we really should deliver five to 10 years from now because we have a well-defined roadmap or at least we have 10 shots at the goal and maybe one of them will work. <laughs> what you do see is a tremendous amount of money that venture capitals controls. Uh, what is it, 156 billion invested in year 2020 in startup companies, uh, over 400 million a day, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, only a very small fraction of that money is invested in hard tech companies. And I'm not just singling out here uh, microelectronics in general, because I think it's hard to define a semiconductor. Um, in my companies, a semiconductor is made of molecules and quantum dots. And those enable now $100 billion industries, right? Because we have stepped away from silicon as an opportunity. But you can think of it as CMOS plus, <laughs> silicon plus, because they do sit on silicon electronics, but they enable different kinds of semiconductor behavior. These are things that are really hard to scale because the present industry is entrenched in the particular ways of going. And the Lego box that TSMC or Samsung gives us, that's it. Rather than asking what are the additional opportunities. I'm also going to highlight just two more things, John. Um, one, it takes, if you look at any of the startups that succeeded in launching an idea, typically their exit was being acquired by an existing large company or maybe even standing alone. A journey a typical startup from a beginning to the end takes is at least 10 years and $100 million. That's the scale of needed investment per idea that we want to scale. VCs don't have the patience for that. The money they invested over 10 years, uh, if it earns 10% interest in stock markets, that would be equivalent to them taking a risky bet on a hard tech idea. So the question is, is there a way to reduce the amount of time a new idea takes to actually grow so that the VCs can invest 156 billion or at least a larger fraction of that money into hard tech ideas? Can we make a hard tech idea enough mature so that it looks like in five years might become something real? And what would that take? And again, that value of that bridge is what it takes a place that can naturally connect the complexity of industry that is very rigid with the flexibility and simplicity of academic discoveries and hence generate a space in between that has the tools so that the startups don't have to buy the tools. <laughs> That's often what most of the expense is in and indeed allows it to start right off rather than waiting a year and a half to build their own prototyping space and connect it to a place where you have a ton of talent. And now I'm self speak, you know, servingly speaking here of universities because the one thing we have in plentitude at places like MIT and other universities is people who are about to lose their job and are eager to make the next job, meaning they're about to graduate and leave MIT <laughs> and are looking for the next thing to do, hence have all the enthusiasm and drive to build that next company, except they need just a little bit of capital and a place where they can have their tools to try the, those ideas out. As we turn, thank you very much, Vladimir, Suzy, uh, Ajit. As we turn to the second uh, theme here, I want to highlight uh, something that's emerged out of this conversation, uh, which is, uh, on the one hand, there's a leadership um, race uh, in the uh, production side of the game uh, toward uh, ever finer uh, uh, nanometer uh, production, uh, which is uh, one part of the competition and losing that uh, has the risk of not being able to sustain the rest of the uh, development chain from R&D through uh, design, uh, through equipment and the like. And the second, which I think all of you have emphasized 
is there's also the question of disjuncture um, in the kinds of technology to emerge um, that uh, if we ch keep chasing along the existing uh, rail cap or the disjunctures, we discover that we've lost in. Uh, in case, uh, the question really becomes one of how do we have both uh, address uh, both challenges. And importantly in this, is this really just a China versus US business model, an Asia, Samsung, uh, TSMC uh, challenge, or is there a place for Europe as one of uh, uh, those who uh, pushed questions forward to us have asked, is there a place for Europe in this? Is this only a two or three way race or is there a spot for Europe? We can come back to that. Or if there's a brief remark on that, that one of you wants to make now, uh, please go ahead. And, okay, um, we, we'll leave Europe silently on the sideline for uh, uh, for the uh, uh, for the moment. So that takes us to the second theme that we want to address here, which is um, that the and I should note that, and it's becoming clear in this conversation for those of you outside the industry that the semiconductor industry is often broken for a convenience of discussion into interconnected interwoven segments, R&D, design or architecture of the chips, equipment and materials, and production and manufacturing. So uh, that said, uh, as we try and deal with the question of how do we sustain innovation and competitive leadership, uh, Susie, you've emphasized in the conversations we've had uh, the importance of R&D, which has come up again here. Uh, is that simply investment in industry R&D or in university research? Uh, uh, what is the importance of training uh, in this? And more generally, what can government do to try and address this um, package of problems that are, are loosely the research and development foundations of the whole industry? So that's a, a really challenging um, question. And, you know, listening to Vladimir's comments and, and others' comments, you know, and looking back, at, we've all been in the industry quite a while, and looking back at, um, you know, we used to have Motorola producing chips, we used to have IBM, and, you know, there's sort of an alarming trend here when you only have, you know, in terms of big companies, you only have, you know, the Qualcomm's and the Intel's and, and such for these advanced um, microcomputers. But um, so I think there's two, there's two dynamics at play here. Um, it is not the case, I think that every, everybody realizes that um, you can bring back um, you know, fabrication to US soil or to allied soil by just throwing money at the problem. It's uh, money helps, um, but it's, it's a tremendous, it takes a tremendous amount of expertise um, to bring up a, uh, a new fab, you know, I'm sure Intel has many folks from Intel have many stories about this as well. But, you know, we were, we, we have worked actually with TSMC and Samsung for, for years to help them with um, uh, bringing up a, a fab. And it's a very complicated business, um, man manufacturing uh, chips. And so the, they have invested heavily in those you know, foundry engineers and, and uh, those, those tools, the whole industry is, is incredibly co uh, complex. But to your, to your point, um, we, we not only need you know, the investment in, in money, we need the investment in training. And to, do, to make that investment in training, we, it's kind of a virtuous cycle. We also need to, you know, people who go to, to university and they, you know, they study engineering and such, they, they need to have it, a place to go, right? When they get out of, when they get out of university. And so you, we see this spiral, or I see this spiral, we saw it also in communications research. We see this spiral of there's fewer and fewer companies and fewer and fewer startups and fewer and fewer places for uh, some of these students to, to go when they get out of university. So they're not interested. For example, they're not interested necessarily in studying semiconductor manufacturing or, or fabrication. And so that's, a, that's something that um, investment in, in both universities and investment in, in you know, companies for these 
these uh, students to go to after they graduate is, is I think very important. And Vladimir had a really interesting um, sketch of, um, of his, his bridge plan is something I think is really in, intriguing because right now the model with universities and companies uh, at least universities and sort of established companies is, you know, you, you go get your, your bachelor's, your master's, your PhD, and we hire mostly, you know, master's students uh, or PhD students. And, and then you do this transition and you go to, you go to a company and then you get trained and, and the, uh, the rest is, is history. But it's really intriguing to, to look at some, some better bridge than, than that model that's been around for frankly, you know, probably 60, 60 years. And so I, th I think it's intriguing to look at that kind of a, a model where you could ha have a more active uh, transition for these, these uh, students, both into mature companies or you know, com established companies and potentially startups as well. I think Vladimir was talking about it as a way to incentivize startups, but I think it could also work very well as a way to get Qualcomm good employees or get, the, get Intel good employees. If, if I can add to Susan's comments, John. Well, in, in fact, I was about to call on you. So in fact, it's perfect. So why don't you comment on those and then pick up the question of radical innovation uh, as well? Of course, uh, Susan, thank you very much. Uh, you know, indeed, I completely agree with you. It is the investment in training is the key. And uh, if the student doesn't see what their next stage in life is going to be, they're not going to spend their time uh, choosing to be a hardware engineer or developer of new materials. Uh, in our EECS department at MIT, and we are one of the few that still has the two connected, there is no question <laughs> that we have hundreds per year of CS majors, and we have maybe 10 to 20 per year of uh, EE majors in our undergrad education. Our grad education balances that, right? Uh, we have roughly half-half, but in our undergrad, uh, we don't have a pipeline that we can feed our grad experiences. The result is that uh, we look at our graduate students and what do they want? How, maybe a third become professors. Uh, a third of them roughly start startup companies uh, because they do not want to step into a small number of the existing companies as they'll be doing someone else's yesterday's technology, as opposed to asking about what's new. After all, they spend their PhD being told that you can reinvent technology from scratch. They have done this reinvention of technology from scratch. No one is picking it up. No big industry, IBM, you know, what used to be IBM Yorktown, Bell Labs would approach you after the talk and ask you if, if they can spend next seven years working on your great idea so that it can be scaled up in that 10 year journey uh, of growing a new idea into something. And so they say, well, I should do this. I mean, I really believe in this. This is the best thing since sliced bread because I put my heart and soul uh, developing it as a PhD. So I want to start the startup. And there is a big challenge, which is that that talent, unless they do start the startup, they'll end up uh, maybe joining a VC firm as an analyst, <laughs> maybe becoming a patent lawyer maybe joining a business firm. Again, it's because they are highly talented. They are quantitative. They are, need to feed a family of the future. And consequently, they choose to step out of the discipline. So we are not giving them a way forward or the reason to have a way forward. And the present allure of the companies like Google um, you know, are intriguing enough. They'll pay you enough to redo yourself and stop doing hardware and start doing software, or at least kind of try to marry the two if you can. So radical innovation, <laughs> I think it'd be dramatically increased um, by, we already have plenty of it. We'd really just need to come up with a way to scale it, make it live up to year five. And I say first three years happen at universities, next to our proto startup uh, to a prototype. And then at year five, the VCs might actually come to us because they can see five years from that point, they might start making money on our idea. And now you have $150 billion of possible investment and plenty of ideas for Qualcomm, Apple, and others to pick as they acquire the, the startup teams that are going to provide a new, tremendously transformative idea that has not been seen before. That's a simple model, right, of thinking of it. But I think it's there has to be 
a customer pool that necessitates the training of the new talent. And the customer pool in this case is whoever has the money. And government has it to enable us to make a bridge, but it has to be industry that guides us. Is it VC industry or indeed established companies that are gonna support that next innovation pipeline? If I, can... I, don't think it, I don't think it has to be an either or either. Exactly, <laughs> yes, <come> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. yeah, and, you know, Qualcomm is actually a pretty, pretty darn good place for PhD students to go, but it doesn't have to be an either or, but I, I think looking hard, and I don't have a silver bullet for, for this, um, but looking hard at sort of the model between um, universities and either startups or mature companies is absolutely essential, because I, I think we seem to be using the model that's been around for 60 years. If I could, uh, before turning to the next to Ajit, um, I want to note that both of you, in a sense, are pointing to the limits of the current venture model, which has been so successful over so many years. So the real question is how to bridge between ideas and the point at which venture companies uh, can, in fact, re-enter the game. Uh, because uh, in the current form, uh, many of those ideas simply get dropped because they don't fit the current venture uh, uh, model of, uh, of innovation finance. And it's an, I think it's partly training and it's partly a question of addressing this issue of how do we structure uh, uh, invent investment models uh, that can bridge uh, uh, between the university uh, and the traditional venture game, if you will. Uh, before I turn to you, Ajit, I want to say that there are a couple of questions that have come in that I think uh, in your response to what I'm going to ask you, you might uh, take up. Um, both uh, uh, in uh, two, two of the uh, folks in the audience, Steve uh, Smith and Amit uh, Paraikya, I, forgive me for, from LAM Research, forgive the, um, uh, the pronunciation, and Tom Shattuck uh, from Foreign Policy Research Institute have, have noted that there are water shortages throughout uh, Taiwan, and that it's also an issue in Korea. And they're asking whether over time, those climate related kinds of issues uh, will in fact represent a challenge to uh, the stability of the, um, of the supply chain. Um, and uh, someone has also asked, where does the rest of the world uh, uh, fit into this story? Uh, particularly places like uh, uh, Latin America, Monica Mede, at IADB has been asking that question. But those form part of what I want to turn to you with, uh, Ajit, uh, which really is, let's turn to the supply chain itself, uh, which is that the complexity and global interdependence of the supply chain, the semiconductor supply networks, really cannot be understated. Uh, there are firms from key countries contributing materials, design, equipment, manufacturing, packaging, and the like. And with this foundation in place, uh, the question really is obvious. What is it needed for firms to have a resilient supply network that will permit them to ensure the availability to their customers, their companies that rely on them uh, in markets from automotive to digital infrastructure? Uh, we can leave the military aerospace questions to you, Melissa, uh, for, the next, uh, for the next panel. Uh, and the question is, given the complexity uh, of this uh, supply uh, network, uh, is, the road to is there a road to resilience? And does that really involve having multiple suppliers from multiple geographic locations to avoid disruptions? Is that possible in the current business, let alone uh, geostrategic environment? Ajit, uh, that's uh, over to you. Um, thank you. Uh, before I come to the, the agency of supply chain, I think the comments that Susie and Vladimir made about the talent and the bridge, I totally agree with that. But there's a fundamental thing which was not addressed, which is there's a shortage of talent because there's a serious problem, not only in US, but around the world, but especially in the US. The STEM education has gone down in the 90s at 40% in, in schools to 11% as we speak. And so we have a real shortage of uh, talent. Now, we bring a lot of foreign students. I'm sure the University of California has the statistics, how many foreign students you have in undergraduate and graduate school. And the same thing for MIT. I mean, we depend on the foreign students who come to this country to help us. But then our policies uh, are such that after 
investing millions of dollars on the graduate students and tell them go home. There's no possibility of getting you H-1B visa or green card. So we train them, spend money on them, and we send them home. So this is a fundamental problem in the Western world, both in Europe and the US, for the STEM education dropping significantly in the last three decades. And that's a leadership issue uh, at the country level, at the, at the industry level, at all levels. In, uh, in Asian countries, STEM education is still very, very well loved. People love STEM education. But the problem is the quantity of uh, students going into STEM education is dropping because the birth rate is 1.3 child uh, children to one couple compared to two children per couple 20, 30 years ago. So we have a real challenge of uh, promoting more STEM education if we want to succeed in this industry because and now coming to the resiliency, there are multiple challenges for having a robust supply chain. Yes, uh, multiple uh, suppliers will always be the right thing to do. But again, we cannot forget this industry is highly practical intensive. Uh, Ajit, we're having trouble hearing you. If you can speak more into the microphone. I'm sorry, uh, if I get close to the microphone. So what I'm saying is that uh, this uh, multiple uh, suppliers is always a good thing to have. Today, yes, we depend heavily on one supplier, which is TSMC for the bleeding edge and followed by Samsung. Yes, there are a lot of vulnerabilities to, to, the, to these. Uh, I mean, we had uh, serious uh, geopolitical issues uh, creating trade tensions in the last four years. The supply chain was working, if you look at it uh, until recently. But last four years had major problem because of the trade tensions even the US, China, uh, Japan, Korea trade tensions, that created a lot of uh, uh, rude awakening that should we have a uh, diversified uh, supply chain and some of the companies started doing it. It's not easy because things have been uh, in this setup for the last 40, 50 years. And uh, last four years, people started to do some simple uh, components manufacturing offload from China to other Asian countries. So this has been going on, but I think the other things we need to also be aware of, we are also vulnerable to, to the pandemics like COVID-19 and God forbid if there's another variant which uh, becomes even more strong, we're gonna be in deeper trouble. And uh, the other is the climate control that uh, one of the, the, the question came up. That's a serious issue. I mean, if you, we cannot forget, we had SARS in 2003, and that really definitely interrupted our business and disrupted our businesses. We had a recession in 2008, 2009 in US. Uh, we had tsunami in Japan, I think in 2011. And it is very common in Taiwan. We have typhoons virtually every year. And there have been time when things have been shut down and including TSMC for a couple of days or three days. Fortunately, no major thing. We had major floods in uh, Bangkok uh, in Thailand, actually, or the whole country uh, s several years ago and shut down a lot of the assembly factories for computers and, uh, and the semiconductors. So we are vulnerable to all these things. And it leads to all the uh, concerns that we need to recognize that if this industry is going to double in the next 10 to 12 years, how do we build the resilient supply chain so that we do not get, basically get more immunity to these, uh, these calamities? So yes, the bringing a, a manufacturing fab in uh, uh, US, like TSMC has announced building fab, I welcome that. And uh, this this morning there was an announcement that Europe is going to, uh, to build their ro uh, robustness of the manufacturing of our semiconductors and quantum computing in the next five years. China announced as a, as, uh, as, as a, uh, Victoria mentioned this morning, the China announced yesterday next five year plan to become more self-reliant on their things. So every country is thinking about how to really make yourself resilient and uh, immune to the to the, the, the calamities that uh, I talked about. So I think it's time for us to really revisit that. And I go back to my earlier statement of that, we need a national strategy in US and a strong leadership on ensuring that we do not become victim to any of these uh, issues uh, uh, coming in the future, uh, as we are today, uh, victim to the to, to the pandemic. So with that, I will say, 
there's a lot of lot we can do there's a growth many countries can participate the, the, the logic business itself is going to more than double in next 10 years today we run about 225 billion memory is at 140 billion today it's going to triple in next 10 years to 480 billion and the all other in semiconductors because as uh, suzy mentioned that you know cell phone yes one or two are the bleeding edge uh, chips but then there are a lot of lagging edge and mature chips and all that is going to be needed so we need all kind of fabrication manufacturing and not only us but many other major countries who can contribute because we need labor we need talent we need capital so all this requires a major strategic discussion in us as well let me um say that uh, the question of uh, this robust supply chain supply network in general and the elements that go into it uh, is absolutely critical um, my first encounter with the whole semiconductor discussion was in the middle of the us japan trade wars uh, and part of the concern at the time was uh, that uh, japan was buying up all of the american equipment companies uh, or dominating them and that therefore the question was how did we sustain uh, a competitive position if we didn't have cutting edge uh, equipment and materials uh, producers and i think that's part of why i raised the question of whether uh, we need to create as a policy goal um, how do we uh, in fact create the environment in which we can work with folks from other countries on a secure basis uh, so that we don't have to have a autarkic uh, set of semiconductor worlds in Europe, in the United States, in Asia, because it won't work. Uh, and uh, the question will be how to accomplish that. Uh, before we turn, we're, we're going to start turning to some of the questions um, from the audience, um, and uh, they build on some of the issues that uh, have been raised. So I'm going to throw them out, and if you folks can sort of uh, respond to them. Uh, one of the questions which links up with this question of the strength of the supply network was from Leland Nicholson, who asked, assuming that semiconductor manufacturers are so highly mechanized, mechanized uh, why do companies produce in other countries versus the U.S.? Uh, you folks have hit on aspects of that, but it probably is worth being explicit about it, particularly since there will be um, government policies uh, aimed at uh, creating funding to try and assure that there is both advanced and mature uh, foundry capacity in the United States. So that becomes a crucial question. What really, in a highly mechanized world, why is it that uh, there's even an issue? Uh, Ajit, you're about to respond, and I'll turn to Susie and Vladimir fairly briefly. Well, I think one of the reasons is that uh, we, unlike US, uh, many countries have been offering very uh, substantial in, uh, incentives or subsidies to build manufacturing fabs. A fab, bleeding, bleeding edge fab today costs about $20 billion. And uh, if the, the company gets a substantial portion funded uh, or subsided by, sub subsidy by, by the government, uh, they, they, that's where they go. And also, uh, yes, the mechani mechanized, but we still need uh, high, highly skilled talent, and thus the talent problem is still a big issue. So you can build a fab in uh, Asian countries, and uh, you can easily get the talent there. But uh, in US, if you, for example, the the fab building in uh, for TSMC in Arizona, I think the one of the questions that I am addressing with them is how will we support the talent for for fab in US? We need to address these issues. But I think the level playing field is not there yet. So that's why this, this CHIP Act uh, we, we put in the, in, in the uh, next last year. I, I'm hoping that that will go through with all the approvals and uh, uh, appropriation of funds. And that will actually help to bring more manufacturing in US, more equipment uh, and uh, uh, innovation and design centers uh, in US. And I think, like I said before, the industry is gonna double in size. There's a role in all big countries to play in, uh, to have this uh, multiple uh, suppliers of uh, design uh, and equipment manufacturing and, and vapor fabrication and so on. Uh, so I think there's a role for, for many countries to play in this. Before I turn to Vladimir or, or Susie to respond to this, a, uh, along this line, a fairly provocative question has come in. So I think we should uh, try and adjust it from Donald McClellan who says, 
Why create new players when we could slash should uh, do more to protect current producers and encourage them, Samsung, TSMC, to have greater redundancy globally in different places, countries, rather than trying to create a potential decoupling of design rules with another foundry? Uh, that's one part of it. Could we force this through uh, greater disclosure about vendor concentration risk uh, by OEMs like Apple and uh, the like? Shouldn't they drive to have more secure supply chains by encouraging current players to be in more places? So the core question I, uh, uh, is, uh, does it matter that there's a concentration by firm, not just location, uh, of uh, those who are providing production capacity and defining design rules. Uh, Vladimir, then Susie. Was, oh, well, you're both, you're both, I can see, eager to respond to that. So if you can both respond. Uh, no, no. Ladies Please first, see. ladies first, Susie, uh, and then Vladimir. We'll try to be brief. I just wanted to um, comment on the previous question, is, which maybe wasn't as provocative, but you know, the, the factory floor itself, it, you know, it's a clean room, in fabricating chipsets and it's all automated and it's incredibly impressive, but that's only the piece that spits out the final piece of silicon. Their fabs um, employ thousands, as Ajit said, thousands of high-skilled um, workers and the amount of labor, uh, if you high-skilled labor that it takes to actually fabricate a, a chip and manufacture it with a proper yield and you know, work with the design companies, and you know, look at the the failure returns. Is it's it's very it's very labor intensive in a different way than you know old old school uh, manufacturing. I also wanted to mention that um, the tools companies um, that that make these uh, both you know software and and hardware, if you will, physical tools that. Uh, actually fabricate these chips. They, they number one, those are incredibly com complex businesses and they also employ a lot of these people. Um, and, and I will turn it over to Vladimir. The, the comment on the, um, you know, is it, is it sufficient to, does it have to be U.S. ownership? And I, I personally believe it doesn't have to be U.S. ownership on, on U.S. soil. I think that companies like uh, Qualcomm, we, we want second and third and fourth choices. The, the challenge is, you know, if Taiwan has an earthquake or something happens in, in one part of the world or we run out of water somewhere else, um, you know, design companies or cannot afford to put all of their eggs in one basket. I will turn it over to Vladimir now. <laughs> Thank you, Susan uh, and Atif. Um, you know, uh, John, uh, I think uh, I agree with Susan. I don't think it needs to be on U.S. soil. Um, after all, if you transform us back to the 1950s and 60s, and imagine we were in a position where there is a leading vacuum tube maker that we just are not matching in the United States, should we build a vacuum tube factory or should we reinvent the transistor? Um, and my bet would be to reinvent the transistor, right? Because uh, we can do a catch up. Uh, and I think a catch-up is needed, especially if we fear national uh, need uh, that might arise, and the second panel will address that. But uh, if we have enough money, yes, sure, we should go ahead and have a five nanometer capability for the second and third choice opportunity, and also to serve as the, maybe a motivator to some of the working force development in the United States. I think where our win is, and traditionally has been, is that we reinvent the technology. Um, and I'll highlight here that new ideas in the 1990s were the ideas of strained silicon. Uh, I, it was tried out in 1990. It took till 2003, I believe, to get it actually tested out by Intel as an idea. And it was kind of floated as here, we'll try something new. 13 years of what is now a standard technology for us to accept. And no questions, you didn't need to build a new foundry. You can actually use the same foundry and adjust the tool sets a little bit as the etching process needs to be a little bit different. Um, another, a little more recent example, high K dielectrics took over a decade for it to be exported from the research labs into industry saying, we are willing to try another chemical inside our well-perfected foundry so we can get a better performance of these silicon chips. 
there is a tremendous amount of investment in the present model of building the designing microelectronics. And that is really hard to dislodge and ask to do something new. Hence why I mentioned carbon nanotubes, uh, electronic circuits that, yes, it's gonna take a decade before we have the dare and billions <laughs> to actually try something out. But you know what, that idea on paper at least appears to consume a lot less power than today's existing technology. If we can make superconducting wires as opposed to regular conducting wires uh, between our transistors inside our chip and cool everything down to 77 Kelvin, we can dramatically reduce the power of the cloud computing centers. But that would require us to actually spend time and money on uh, CMOS that operates at cryogenic temperatures. That you know, we need to go and figure out how to do. And none of the foundries will accept it for next half a decade or more. However, there is a clear roadmap for us to actually achieve this in a similar fashion. You can talk about three, four different layers of flavors of quantum computing that's right now being pursued. And some of the industry uh, on the side is indeed investing in this idea, hoping that maybe it will come through, but not the usual players. These are actually software companies that are making a lot of investments in these quantum computing ideas. Others as well, I don't mean to uh, diminish. <laughs> Indeed, Ajit, you probably have a much better map of who truly is investing in it. My, all, my only point is that looking into where we need to invest, we could and should, if we truly need it for the country, have a local on US soil, five nanometer, three nanometer, two nanometer technology. But unless we actually start building the technology for 10 years from now and sustain that, we will both lose the talent in the United States to do so, and we will never have that next technology in our hands. Someone else will hold it. And a great example of this, just as a, to, to close it, <laughs> I spent a lot of my time developing a much simpler technology of displays. Uh, and is it cathode ray tubes we used to have uh, that then led to liquid crystal displays that then led to what are now organic LEDs. Uh, every one of those uh, has in significant part been invented in the United States. Every one of those has been prototyped in the United States. And then we recognize these are materials we never touched before. It will require a lot of handling of new stuff. Let someone else perfect it. We will sell the materials, we'll sell the patents, we'll keep on innovating. So our real strength seems to be, let's keep inventing and starting new startups or indeed inventing inside the existing companies. But traditionally, it turns out that is a lot harder, uh, at least when it comes to statistically, what has shown over the last 25 years, uh, where the de-investment on general scale across all of the grand industries of the world uh, in uh, R&D, uh, there is a dramatic diminishment, hence the movement for open innovation and cross uh, pollination between companies that emerged as necessity for launching new ideas that I startups have, naturally progress. <laughs> I have two thoughts before I turn toward to getting some closing remarks from all of you, and we have six minutes. Uh, I should say that, um, you know, the question becomes, can one develop breakthrough technology if one doesn't have the financial and, uh, ex and current manufacturing, a financial base and uh, manufacturing expertise in today's generation of, of production. Uh, in other words, will it be TSMC, uh, Samsung buying a lot of the breakthrough or experimenting with the breakthroughs that you're talking about because they have uh, a know-how of how to do that. Do we need, uh, years ago I uh, wrote a book and one of the lines in it was you can't control what you can't produce or you can't innovate what you can't produce. So I would raise that as a question. The second is on the TSMC um, and Samsung issues. I know it's been pointed out to me by folks in a number of companies uh, that I've, I've talked to, uh, that uh, they provide design services and that part of the purposes of providing design services to production customers is in fact for them to build the direct links to the customers, uh, cutting out uh, the um, uh, links that uh, um, uh, the companies uh, building equipment and producers have. Um, spreading their wings across wider swaths of the industry. So I think that uh, is that as much of a risk as some of the companies think. So those are the two issues that 
do we need to be able to produce in order to innovate? And do we, uh, in fact, have to be careful about just accepting uh, the design services of companies that cut up, uh, come as a layer between um, our equipment and materials producers, our, our uh, design-based comp companies, uh, and their customers? Um, I'm going to let uh, start with Susie and then Ajit, and maybe uh, since we're starting to run out of time, you could sort of build in a couple of quick remarks on what you think the government might uh, do as a, um, a direct solution, uh, other than just endorsing Victoria Coleman's proposal. Uh, what would you do to actually implement that? So for the three of you, Susie, Ajit, and then Vladimir, um, uh, we have four or five minutes. You know, again, it, it comes back to uh, um, it comes back to R and D. Whether it's R and D supporting R and D, and whether it's uh, uh, R and D for you know creating the technology that goes into to um, to these uh, these chips, or or the R and D that goes into the tools that uh, factories use, that manufacturers use, or the R and D that goes into building building and operating um, these. Uh, uh, actual fabrication plants. And so, so I'm going to bring it back to Dr. Coleman's comments <laughs> once again, because I think what we, where we are is we're, we're sort of stuck in that um, valley, that lab to fab valley of, of death. And to get out of that, we, we, need, we need very specific policies uh, and around uh, you know, intellectual property, protecting intellectual property, um, not only supporting R&D, but enhancing R&D. Uh, if you look at the last, you know, the last 20 years, we are in many industries, we are losing that R&D um, edge. And I guess my last um, comment is start now. You know, I don't care if it's, um, uh, you know, TSMC in Arizona and or Samsung in, in uh, Austin or and, and or US fabs, U, uh, US companies or startups starting fabs in, in Latin America. But the best time to start would have been 10 years ago. The second best time to start is, is today. And one of my concerns is the, the conversation is wonderful, but one of my concerns is if we, if we, if we wait three years, we're another three years, you know, down, we're, we're another three years behind because these, these projects just take, whether it's a startup or whether it's a, a mature fab or whether it's a leading edge fab or one for accessory chipsets, they take, a, they take a lot of time. It's a very, very complex um, problem. Thank you, Susie. Ajit, you have one minute. <laughs> so I agree with what Susie said. The time is now because the industry, you know, I, I wish that I was starting this industry today instead of four decades ago, because the, the future looks simply wonderful. There's a lot, a lot of growth coming. And one of my uh, passion is that if we look at what happened last uh, uh, 40, 50 years, we got the industry 4.0 revolution. And now the new uh, uh, innovations and disruptions uh, enable the industry 5.0, which will provide huge societal and economic benefits. But one comment, I will say that the role of government is very important. The government should really intervene in the business only for national security reasons or cyber security reasons and the IP protection. That's the let, leave the business people alone to support them to, to, to keep the robust supply chain going because there are a lot of vulnerabilities. We should control the things that we, we can focus on. So. We should not interfere and make things more difficult than they already are. They're very complex industry and very important, very significant. I think I will go back to my the opening remarks of Dr. Uh, uh, Coleman to, to become a, a key figure in the, in the executive branch and uh, invite people like uh, Vladimir and Susie and myself, and we'll support her with uh, all these important strategic uh, imperatives for the country. Vladimir, Vladimir, we're now we're now I have, running I have, out. I have a half a sentence, and that is that it's uh, indeed uh, lab to new fab uh, rather than lab to the existing fab. Uh, that is what we need to support. Excellent, perfect. Uh, with that, thank you all for um, 
really wonderful remarks. I've uh, been told that there's been excellent feedback on the quality of the discussion, and I'm delighted with that. With that, may I turn this uh, over to uh, Dr. Griffith. Thank you so much, John. So we've just had a fabulous keynote from Dr. Victoria Coleman outlining this space more broadly and the policy opportunities. We then just had an excellent conversation in panel one, really talking about the state of play of industry in the global market and from a business perspective, how some of these concerns kind of hash out over time. We're now gonna pivot our attention to that geopolitical national security discussion that we were sort of dancing around in that first panel. So what this is gonna look like is we will do a brief moderated discussion between myself and three very fabulous panelists. We're gonna focus on two sets of concerns. First, scoping the problem. When we say national security concerns with semiconductors, what do we mean? And then we're gonna really delve into some policy solutions. Because as you saw coming up in the kind of tail end of that first panel, this is where the rubber meets the road. We can have as many of these conversations as we like, but unless we're sort of implementing solutions, we're gonna fall further and further um, away from our moment of opportunity. As a reminder, please do participate throughout by submitting questions to us here at STIP. You can email us those questions at stip at wilsoncenter.org, or you can tweet them at us, and that's at Wilson Center STIP, or excuse me, at Wilson STIP. Let me briefly introduce our three panelists. First, Eric Berger. Eric Berger is a research professor of computer science at Georgetown University. We are very lucky to have him here today. He has extensive experience in both industry and government in this area, including the FCC and the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy. We're also very fortunate to have Meg Hardin. Meg Hardin is Vice President of Government Relations at Infineon Technologies Americas Corps. At Infineon, she has a long history on advocating for technology and innovation policies that support competitive US semiconductor industry, as well as a secure, healthy, and innovative ecosystem. Our final panelist who will round us out that we're equally fortunate to have is Eileen Tangle. She's a senior partner at Incutel. And as a strategic investor, she identifies and invests in innovative technology startups to support the mission of the United States intelligence and defense communities. Prior to joining Incutel, she worked extensively in industry in this area. So we have a wonderful lineup um, of panelists. As we've sort of hinted at in our panel description, there's a really vibrant national security conversation that's happening in this space. And there's really three components to that national security conversation. And I'm gonna ask, given the expertise in our virtual room, that each of you sort of pull apart, give us a sense of one of those. And we'll start with you, Eric. The first national security concern is about this question of dependency. So Eric, as you know, semiconductors and national security are first and foremost evoked in the same sentence because we're concerned about what relies on them, these foundational technology concerns. Can you walk us through that dependency landscape? What are the main concerns from the national security point of view? Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for the question. And although I first, as in customary in DC, I have to point out that my comments today are in my Georgetown capacity and do not necessarily reflect the positions or policies of the previous or current administration or of the FCC. So let's first look at where our military uses semiconductors. They're used for communications, command and control systems, for targeting systems, for radar systems, for autonomous systems such as drones. Now these applications like to have high performance. If you can compute a little bit faster, you can outmaneuver your adversary and have a higher percentage on attacking or defending. And they like to have low relative power. Uh, and that lets you have longer autonomous missions, higher density compute resources, and so on. And we also have a focus on high performance computing. You know, if you have access to advanced semiconductors, you can have faster or higher fidelity AI or machine learning convergence and training. You can have faster design simulations, so you can have shorter design cycles. And in the military context, developing and enhancing weapon systems, modeling weapon yield, and high fidelity war gaming to again, give you an advantage uh, when, if you actually have to go fight. Now these applications like to have ultra high density, high performance central processing units or CPUs, graphics processing units or GPUs, and application specific integrated circuits, which you might've heard of being called ASICs. It's also important to remember though that economic security 
is a major part of national security. So this question of semiconductors and national security go well beyond the military and direct national security applications of semiconductors. The US has the strongest military and spends the most in absolute and per capita terms because we have the economy to support that spending. And that does not take into account the important factors of military and civilian dual use technologies. For example, those high performance computing tools that help build a better bomber can also help build a better transport plane. And digital signal processing and high frequency power amplifiers that build better radars can also power better Wi-Fi and 5G. And so that's where we get a lot of this positive reinforcement cycle. Because if you have more success with commercial chips, means you have more experience designing chips, which lowers the unit costs or creates more value per chip, which means more profit, which results in more ability to pay for national security needs. And what is that paying for? More specialized chips for national security applications, where we get more experience designing chips, so lower unit costs or more functionality per chip, which results in a secure nation which protects economic activity. And then we try to repeat that cycle. Thank you, Eric. I think you did a really good job of sort of building off some of the comments in the first panel for us about these geostrategic, economically important technologies, AI, quantum, 5G, and then also this conversation about that these are also utilized in defense, intelligence, national security settings as well, and the feedback loop that we get there between sort of strong economics incentives, economic viability, and then strong national security incentives and national security viability. I want to pivot us um, to you, Meg, and the second national security concern, in addition to dependency, we know it's important we depend on it, is this conversation about resilience or availability of supply and the security of supply chains. And we heard the specifically the availability question discussed from a, a business perspective, an industry perspective in the first panel. Can you give us a sense about why availability of supply is a national security concern? And then I know you at Infineon spend a lot of time during your day thinking about the security of those supply chains as well. So could you help us understand that second dynamic of supply chain questions? Meg, I believe you might be muted. Thanks, Melissa. That's a common um, occurrence. Um, thanks very much. Um, and thanks to Eric for his comments. I think we've heard really clearly over the last hour and a half how fundamental semiconductors are to so many other industries in the United States. And I think the more recent focus um, on the auto chip shortage has, has proven um, the, the point of how uh, shifts in demand for, for various reasons, it could be a tsunami, or in this case, it could, it could be a, a really sharp increase in demand can really throw off the semiconductor supply chain. It's a very long and complex supply chain. There can be 400 to 800 process steps in building any one chip. It can take six to 18 months and that can be in multiple locations around the world. So there's not um, a, a lot of flexibility in the semiconductor supply chain. It doesn't really mesh very well with a kind of just-in-time delivery mentality of, of a lot of end users. So how, how do we go about ensuring that we don't harm the economy or harm uh, critical infrastructure and national security when there are periods of time like today where there are serious chip shortages? And um, how do you guarantee both the integrity of the product that's being delivered as well as uh, get that delivered on time? And from Infineon's point of view, we would say you have to do some really um, deep investment in, in your supply chain. And, and that investment is in, in um, everything from facilities and operational excellence to business continuity. That means uh, IT systems, as you noted, Melissa, and um, cybersecurity planning, um, environmental compliance. There's just a very long list of, of, honestly, a lot of those processes are standardized and they're checked and audited by customers on a regular basis. Um, so there's accountability to that. But there are also a lot of best practices. And again, we we have invested enormously in this for both our commercial customers here in the United States, as well as our government customers. And these include having uh, some of the things that were mentioned earlier, backup production sites, 
long-term contracts with our suppliers with a very holistic approach and asking them to mirror our own best practices for secure supply chains, um, manufacturing in multiple locations, which was mentioned in the last panel as well, um, and in multiple regions of the world, um, having plant harmonization practices so that we have um, always have real-time visibility into our production capacity and can deliver uh, when we promise. And then for Infineon specifically, we continue to, uh, in addition to using foundries selectively, we continue to invest in increasing our own manufacturing capacity and keeping that up to date. I think it's just really obvious how critical um, supply chain security has become in, in uh, today's world. Thank you, Meg. I think you, I appreciate your comments because it sort of scopes the problem for us, both in terms of the complexity that we face in this space, um, in terms of what goes into just from R&D all the way out to plugging and integrating a chip into a use case um, scenario, but then also really thinking about this as more than just, do you have availability, but is that an in integrity-based process? Can you guarantee the integrity of the chips across their life cycle and, and how they might be used as well? Eileen, I'd like to pivot to you here, because when we think about we're dependent on these chips, both in commercial sectors and national defense sectors, there's a real concern about then given that dependence, having really strong security and availability of supply, there's now this question about where the United States stands and being able to ensure those previous two national security concerns or mitigate them. And one of the common areas that comes up is does the United States have a vibrant domestic industry ecosystem? And the concern most heavily tends to lie on that question of manufacturing at the most advanced process nodes. Can you walk us through this kind of concern about domestic solutions in the space given your work at Incatel and then kind of where we stand and is this kind of fascination about high-end production at those higher kind of five centimeter to seven nanometer um, nodes, is that even the right metric to evaluate U.S. leadership? Uh, great, thanks for the question, Melissa. Um, and, and prior to Incutel, I think some of you know, I, I was also at Applied Materials on the semi-cap equipment side. So I'll be speaking both from sort of that experience. I was also at ARM. So from those experiences as well as from Incutel. So indeed, uh, as, as stated earlier, and, and I think Dr. Coleman mentioned this, most of the state-of-the-art production has moved overseas, right? So to the, but we have to remember why did it move overseas? I think that was one of the questions earlier. One, of course, was indeed the lower costs of labor. The second was uh, foreign government policy, but we also have to remember this, that there were environmental concerns. So having been a process engineer myself, having actually worked in a foundry, there's this thing that's called HF. You don't want that uh, anywhere near you. Um, it's here in California, the places where there were, were factories, those were declared Superfund sites. When, so when you're buying real estate, it's declared there. So you, so you have to keep in mind that it wasn't solely because of the lower cost of labor and government, government policy. There was also environmental concerns with having these things in our country. So that, that's the first thing. Now, if we look today, as I mentioned, there's really one state-of-the-art foundry, that, that's Intel. Now, Intel mostly services itself, but of course is opening itself up to other fabulous startups. So one of the important parts of having next, you know, latest generation here in the U.S. is because then it allows for our startup companies and the new innovation companies to have a place to go. Now, if we look at the CHIPS Act, um, it's helping to try to move, move, you know, production of the, of the state of the art or even close to the state of the art here. But what it doesn't do, and if you actually were to speak to the former CEO of Global Foundries, who the U.S. relies on heavily, is they stopped doing state of the art most because of their shareholders decided they didn't have enough demand. Um, and and if, again, you, you can speak with, with the former CEO of, of what happened, but he was trying to, to get the demand there and they just decided not. So what the CHIPS Act is, is not taking care of is the demand side of the equation. So while there were there previously uh, comments made of, okay, well, the commercial industries have chosen to manufacture uh, at TSMC across the way. The reality is, is there could be policies to incentivize them to produce domestically, and then you can have the foundries here. Now, if we look at, and I think a lot of the panels agree with it, production cap capacity is not going to be and shouldn't be the sole measure of leadership. It is helpful from a national security supply chain point of view, but there are other areas you can really look at. 
if you look at what Dr. Coleman started in, in the beginning, you know, it's, it's very simplified. And I think even those in the semiconductor industry sometimes simplify to, we design it, we ship it over, and then we package it, it comes back. Uh, we at InQtel really look at the industry as a stack and the, and the layers in between. So for example, when you design, a, a chip maker is usually one of two or three tools to design, cadence, synopsis, mentor graphics. Majority is cadence. Those are US firms. Almost every designer has to use one of those software tool packages. We lead in that, that's really good. The next thing that we, you have to look at is when you actually send over to TSMC and, and whomever uh, else, the choke point in the fab is the equipment. This was measured before. And I know there wasn't really a talk about uh, Europe, but for example, in order to make the latest nodes, there is only one company in the entire world that lets you do that. That's called ASML and it's in Holland. And so we do have to work with our allies to make sure that equipment that enables the next generation is something that we and our allies can do together. The other fortunate thing is out of the top three, the other two are Applied Materials and LAM, and they're all in the US. So we have to look at the other areas and it can't just be about uh, you know just the design part, but the other areas um, to make something connected. So I think uh, that that's that's um, you know another area we need to look at in terms of of um, leadership. Uh, finally, I think you know just to echo what uh, Professor Blavik was talking about is you know looking at not just sort of you know bringing over manufacturing and production capacity here but looking at things like materials and equipment. In fact, Applied Materials, if, if you know your history, actually started out as a materials company, but because it was so hard to put down those materials, they became an equipment company. So if you start to look at how do we lead in 10 or 15 years from now, you have to look at different materials, innovation and materials, and then the ecosystem around those materials, whether it be carbon nanotubes or something else can come up. Um, again, I'm going to look to Europe here. For example, China, in order for China SMIC to catch up to, to TSMC, they are heavily relying on IMEC and other European partners to bring up those processes. So we do have to work with allies to ensure you know, that, that they're kind of on our side and, and we don't unfortunately have a equivalent of IMEC. That's what the microelectronics commons idea is, is trying to come up with that. So I, I applaud that. But um, I think, you know, kind of, in summary, we need to look at, it isn't just about production capacity. The CHIPS Act is sort of a little bit too narrow in that that's all it's looking at. You need to look at the demand side. You need to look at innovation. And I haven't really gotten to the venture capital part, but, but seeing as I'm the only venture capitalist, I think on this panel um, and maybe in the event, uh, I just wanna have everybody double click on the venture capital part, okay? So there's a funnel, right? When you're looking at startup companies and there's a lot, and I am an MIT uh, graduate who went to a venture capital startup um, that went public. And then I joined the dark side and became a venture capitalist. Maybe that was good because all the foundries that I was working at all went overseas anyway. But anyway, the, the, the point is, is that if you double click into the venture capital there, I've done a lot of the research on PitchBook. You're gonna see there's money for the seed stage, okay? And then the large companies like Applied, Qualcomm, Intel, they might buy at the seed stage or they might buy at the later stage when something is proven. The issue is the middle of the funnel. There is not enough money for the middle of the funnel. So yes, you can try to start another CNT company, but you're abandoning a lot of the series B ones that are kind of stuck here and cannot find the series B financing. So I think, you know, I know I'm, I've gone much broader than, than your original question, but I do think we need to talk about this as a real problem right now, having, you know, I've invested in over 40 some companies and been on their boards. And it's a, what happened is when the CFIUS came in, the capital for these series B and C companies went away and we have not put it together. I mean, we have not come up with a, a um, substitute for that capital. So there's a lot of funding for the seed and DARPA funds a lot of the seed in the early stage. The, the later stage companies might become when they're about to acquire, but this middle part of the funnel, there, there's a real problem. Thank you so much, Eileen. I think what 
is so helpful about your comments there is scoping the problem both in terms of the problem as it exists the problem is we've understood it in the united states which has dropped off some of these components around demand and where you invest funding at these various stages and then more broadly kind of understanding how we got into this pickle in the first place right that this wasn't just labor is cheaper so everybody left which is sometimes a conversation we have about manufacturing um, but isn't necessarily the most relevant conversation in a capital intensive um, industry over a less labor intensive industry. I want to pivot us before we get into the second half into some of these solutions that you very clearly indicated that you have a lot to say on and I want to give you a chance to speak to. There's a little bit of a, an elephant in the room, which is China. Right. And it seems that you can't have a national security conversation about semiconductor chips or integrated circuits without in some way raising the China question. But one of the realities, and I think we saw this in the first panel and in Victoria Coleman's keynote and in our panel, is that if you look at that ecosystem that's been laid out for you, the United States leads in quite a few of these areas, um, areas maybe such as equipment for manufacturing, that's the United States, Netherlands, Japan. Um, when you look at input materials, raw earth materials, China does have a very strong um, advantage in that space. Design, again, licensing, that's a lot of US companies, a lot of US information kind of pops to the top there. Um, and then a real jostling around use cases on the other end. So that ecosystem, when you look at it from a US-China global politics perspective, um, doesn't seem quite so dire as in the United States has just fallen off the wagon and China's just overtaking us when you look at the entire kind of stack. So it is clear that the United States and China both wanna be a superpower and that technology is an important role in how they think about that and how they think about their political situation. But is it less sort of, this is the end stages, the sky is falling, we're in terrible trouble, or is it more, no, this is gonna be an area of future competition, the writing's on the wall, how do we address that in the future? And I'm just going to um, start with Meg and then I'll move down the line. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Yeah, I, I think I think your assessment is correct. Um, you can say the sky is falling because there's big change on the horizon. But but um, China has a semiconductor industry. China wants to do many of the same things the United States wants to do. Part of those is to advance their their economy um, through technology and and um, have clean power and uh, clean cars and, and all the other things that semiconductors enable. Part of it is clearly a geopolitical agenda as well, and that's where the national security issues um, come in. But um, I think for the industry, for, for the players in the industry, the, the concern comes about that does this alarm or the sky is falling lead to a decoupling, which would be harmful for all of us. Um, we, we can't really operate a global se uh, semiconductor industry with dual sets of standards, dual sets of export compliance, dual sets of manufacturing requirements, um, massive subsidies in certain regions. Um, it really goes against the, the interest of all of us um, because we have a fairly efficient um, global supply chain, a highly integrated um, global production for, for our industry. So this is where the sky is falling. Thank you. Eileen, do you want to add to that? Um, so I, I do agree that that uh, the sky is not 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 falling um, across the the whole area, which is what I was mentioning before. Why we look at the stack and we see, I think there are, there are uh, absolutely places for us to um, maintain leadership, to continue leadership. Perfect. So we're, we seem to be settling on the sky not falling. Eric, we'll see if you agree or disagree. I well, you know, it goes back to something Susie said. You know, the best time to have started to build a factory was 10 years ago. So the sky has not fallen. The US is unquestionably, we have the largest integrated manufacturer. Uh, our friends have the largest foundries. And of the next six integrated manufacturers, you know, a bunch of them are American. And in fact, of the fabulous, the fabulous, the fabulous manufacturers, the fabulous manufacturers, they're all American uh, with depending on who you ask whether or not Broadcom is all American or kind of Singapore American. Uh, and as Eileen mentioned, uh, we dominate design tools. I and mean, the place I headed after MIT and TI was what's today Cadence. But you also have Intel acknowledging that it's falling behind in fab technology. And uh, a lot of that is because of the economics of semiconductor fabrication. You know, we're talking about the startup uh, chasm 
but there's also a chasm even for the big guys. Um, and there are things we do need to you know, be aware of. You know, TMSC is just a PT boat ride away from mainland China. You know, and when I was at TI, uh, I was mentored by a, a person who had served in the Taiwanese Navy in, 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 you know, in the 1970s, talking about how it was actually a shooting war. So you know, that's a thing to be concerned of. And China does consider Taiwan to be a renegade province. And we can look to Hong Kong today to see how that works out. Uh, China does have a large domestic market for chips, uh, Huawei and a much lesser extent ZTE for 5G chips. Uh, and China is highly dependent on the US uh, for uh, intellectual property for that goes to those chips. And likewise, the US companies are highly dependent on those Chinese revenues. Um, and, and it's kind of a catch-22. I mean, there was an outcry by US manufacturers when the former administration proposed blocking sales of advanced technology to those under sanction. But at the same time, those manufacturers saying, oh yeah, oh, by the way, our Chinese customers are maybe paying one fifth of the royalties they owe us. Can you help us you know, get paid? So you know, it is really an interrelated problem. It's like, oh, no problem. We're still number one and China's barely measurable. But the writing is is more than on the wall. wall. Things are happening that that are concerning. Yeah. So I, I might add, it's the sky is not falling, but it might be falling. <laughs> Pretty, you know, especially if we don't uh, keep up the innovation and the capital to to continue to make sure we we keep the current lead. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a really good spot to end and sort of transition to the second half, which is. I think there's a useful corrective that just happened there. Often when we say technology, national security, that anybody in the room goes, China, right? It's almost like a call and response. Um, and that needs to be fleshed out a little bit more and sort of where are we concerned? How are we concerned? Um, where do those concerns matter? What does the ecosystem actually look like? But then similarly, and I think this point that all three of you hit on and has been addressed in the first panel, which is you don't measure US leadership or national security positioning based on where you are today alone. That there needs to be a conversation of, are you making the investments and the policy decisions and building the correct ecosystems so that you are in a good position in five, 10, 20 years um, down the line, those sort of short, long-term, medium, term horizons and pushing that conversation a little bit more so it's not the sky's not falling don't worry about it wash our hands and it's also not um we're doomed china is beating us in every place that matters and we have no other sort of vendors across the stack and where's europe that's also not an adequate sort of um, analysis of that situation. So given that this is our moment, we have a pivotal opportunity here to address this so that we don't end up in a sky falling situation from a national security perspective. I wanna pivot us to the policy space. And we're gonna actually start here with you, Eric, um, given a lot of your experience in government, if you could talk us a little bit through the policy landscape to date, as you all know, there's this sort of jostling or balancing act that sometimes happens between prioritizing industry and innovation and then prioritizing national security concerns. And at different times, we seem to fall on one or the other. Can you give us kind of a brief summary of what that trajectory has looked like? And then I put on your kind of forward guessing hat and give us a sense of where you think the Biden administration may be going in the first kind of 100 to 200 days. Sure. I mean, Melissa, like many things, it's a shade of gray. Uh, you know, there was definitely discussion, you know, is it industry versus national security when we propose to ban exports of American semiconductors and intellectual property to those under sanction? But the objective was to stop a set of companies who had illegal subsidies and had stolen intellectual property, we wanted to stop them in their tracks. And a lot of that is to keep this guy from falling, you know, to deny them the further erosion of the competitiveness of American and, for that matter, uh, uh, companies uh, basically not in the China orbit, uh, and the countries that basically play by the rules. Now, that was the national security position. Uh, and, you know, the industry position, a lot of revenue coming from those nations. But then you have to kind of ask the question, is that really an industry versus national security trade-off? I mean, there's no question that for the domestic companies, their quarterly revenue would take a hit. You know, that if they were going to pay, they weren't going to get paid in that scenario. Uh, but, you know, those companies' boards were also aware that notwithstanding a quarter or two of paying, 
not addressing the underlying economic security issue would result in a greater existential long-term peril. Uh, and that brings it back, you know, losing those companies would be a national security issue. Uh, so I would offer it's not really an industry versus national security trade-off, but really a short-term versus long-term uh, trade-off. And that's the policy thing. You know, this is the leadership opportunity that's really only available to governments. I mean, an industry association might encourage its members to boycott a bad actor or two, but there'll always be a renegade who's going to go after the money. They're going to sell. Whereas a government can enforce sanctions evenly with all players. So the players are almost like, well, please make us not sell as long as you make everybody not sell. But please don't only make us not sell and let our competitors you know, reap the profits. Um, and the other thing that uh, you know, the government can do that companies have a harder time doing is uh, we did convince other countries to have their semiconductor manufacturers honor the boycott. And yes, a lot of semiconductor manufacturers are American, but uh, you know, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Switzerland representing uh, uh, France and Italy, uh, you know, they also have a lot of you know, manufacturing there. Um, as for the Biden administration, I mean, this is straightforward microeconomics in action. So I actually wouldn't expect the current administration to do too much different, uh, maybe more on the international co cooperation front. Uh, and I would expect, you know, still strong engagement and strict enforcement of our anti-dumping laws uh, against people who are violating the law. I think your comment about maybe more on international cooperation pivots us really well um, to you, Meg. And I know, given sort of your company's position, often when we look at sometimes national security conversations in the US, there's a very strong made in America um, undertone that sort of plays here. And it's kind of US only or US alone, let's get the made in America brand going again. Can you talk about to the extent to which this does need to be broader collaborative cooperation? And I think that builds really well off your point here, Eric, about a potential moment of growth in our kind of foreign policy perspectives and approaches. Yeah, sure, Melissa. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of conversations right now in, in the wake of China's drive for autonomy and, and the EU's digital sovereignty movement um, um, and, and our own uh, governments look at our, our supply chain in this industry to think, can we do it all? Can, it, can any region do it all? Is that the answer? I think the answer is obviously no. I mean, the, the amount of capital investment and workforce needs and, and innovation cap capacity, we, we can't have um, siloed semiconductor industries for, for each region of the world. So, um, you know, I think Infineon is a really good example. We've been in the United States for decades um, and we have um, uh, invested in factories here, created jobs here, brought innovation here. And, and the US companies have done the same. They, they are in other regions of the world where they have built factories. And, and I think that the, again, the World Semiconductor Council as an example of how this industry has worked so hard to be effective globally is, is something that we could continue to strive for how to have a resilient supply chain through cooperation uh, of regions uh, in the semiconductor industry. And there's, there's, there's supply chain cooperation. And to, to reference back to Eric, there's trade enforcement cooperation. There's joint collaboration on research. But to me, there's no question that we have to continue to cooperate with our allies and, and to make the most resilient and innovative semiconductor industry. Because once you start making regional uh, industries, um, that you won't have the level of innovation that we are looking at today, which is supporting all of these other advanced technology industries that we all want to lead in. I think that's a useful kind of plea there to sort of think when we're thinking about our national security policy, not to tailor that policy in a way that kind of cripples the industry from which we gain so many downstream benefits, both in terms of economic and societal kind of positives that come out of that, but also some real national security concerns that come out of that. So kind of getting that mix right um, and not doing that in a way that uh, has these regional autonomy models, both from a feasibility standpoint, but also from that's not necessarily the outcome you want if you're hoping to use these technologies robustly in the future. I want to turn to you now, Eileen, because I think 
often in these national security conversations, we list out the same types of players or the same types of solutions on kind of two fronts and you're uniquely positioned to talk about both of those. Um, one of those is that we typically forget to talk about startups in a kind of more robust sense of the word. We tend to move straight to our industry players, incumbent players, industry associations, government, academia, think tanks. So thinking about this kind of startup role and why you and the work that InQtel does see startup is so fundamental to our national security in this space. And then the second piece of that is why venture capital. Um, and you sort of started to touch on that, but I think when we're looking at our solution sets, startups, venture capital are two areas that sometimes get overlooked. So could you flesh those out for us a little? Yeah, sure. Um, so when we kind of just to, to point to the, uh, a little bit back to the, the whole China part, um, I think the first assumption maybe we make um, uh, or I make is is that in terms of you know China catching up, we're just gonna we just assume they're gonna catch up, right? They're they're going to catch up, either by brute force or the Made in China initiatives or whatever the latest initiative is, they're gonna try going to catch up to where we are. Now, people may say, hey, they tried this before and there's no guarantee that will really happen, but I, I don't personally wanna bet on the fact that they're not gonna catch up. So then we really need to look outside of you know, what's going on now and again, look at the disruptive opportunities. So I'll give an example. What if instead of designing it here and shipping it over to uh, Taiwan or Korea or wherever most of these companies do, you know, what if you actually did something, th think about a 3D printer. What if you actually had something called direct write semiconductors where you can load up the machine. I mean, if, if you think about how your printer works today, before you had to go to a printing press. Today, you print it at the printer that HP built for you at your house, right? So this, this idea of let's just disrupt how everything is made today and, and do direct write semiconductors in local areas. These are where the startups are uniquely focused. It is very, very difficult for these large companies. I mean, yes, I was at a venture fund of a large uh, semiconductor cap equipment company, but we are a tiny fraction of what they're doing, right? So, so they, they don't necessarily have all the time in the world to, to do all of these, these groundbreaking next generation things. And that's why the startups, we, we have to focus on this. And unfortunately, they do get left out, out of the conversation. So I'm just gonna you know, share some stats with you. I did an analysis, as I, as I mentioned earlier, on where are the startup companies from 2015 to 17, where were they getting money? And I think you'd be surprised to see that in the early stages, while most of the funders are US, um, in the late stages from 2015 to 17, 66% of the funders were foreign. So of US companies raising series B and C stage capital, they were getting it from foreign sources, 66%. So this is, a, this is really sad because what's happening is you start the innovation here in the US, it some of them finally make it into series, series A and they get the funding and then what? They have to rely on other governments, Singapore, Korea, China, et cetera, to keep going. I, and so, you know, so far, government really either focuses on, you know, the, the labs and the innovation and, and you know, the, the universities, et cetera, or DOD acquisition, you know, but, but what about the middle? And, and that's, that's the, real, the real issue. I think um, when I was at Applied and when I was at ARM, we had investments in funds in those countries because their government, like Korean government, the Singaporean government, the Chinese government, worked with industry to form funds to invest in companies. And we haven't done that here. So, you know, this belief that, okay, we'll just throw it over and then somebody else will catch it on the Series B and Series C, it's not happening. It hasn't been happening for the last seven, eight years. And filling the, just, just filling the funnel which you know, I look at startups all day long, right? And, and yes, there's a lot of good startups that seed in series A and they all come out of you know, my alum where I, at MIT, at Berkeley, at Stanford, but they cannot get past that series B and C um, right now. And, and, and so you know, maybe I will take back the, is there, the sky is not falling on the industry in general, but it's certainly falling for these series B. I mean, I, I can give you countless examples of, these are companies where their technology can be used on mission today for national security and they can't find financing. This, this, it's incredible. 
Now, um, you know, why is that? Well, it's because the exits, right? The, 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 the amounts that Qualcomm applied Intel, whomever is buying them is not giving those series B uh, kind of returns that you need to, to invest. At series A, you're okay, because you might get 10X. At series C or D, that, those kind of investors might want 2X. But this in-between land, that's where I think uh, government really, really needs to play. And I mean, we can look to uh, even our own allies that, that are putting in solutions. So uh, you might have seen on March 1st, the UK is launching a new fund um, called Fut the F Future Fund Breakthrough. And I mean, I think the quote was like, oh, but, but the US is Incutel, but I think I need to dispel what people think Incutel is. Incutel is investing on behalf of the agency and the other intelligence community partners. We are not set up to invest in series B companies in the semiconductor industry. There is actually no one, nowhere in the United States with the government's help that is set up to do that. And so, you know, you'll see us very much, act, um, you know, saying the US needs to solve this kind of in-between problem. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of our recommendations is a microelectronics technology fund to really sort out this growth stage. Very helpful. So I think this actually is a really good opportunity to move us into this conversation that came up in the Q&A. So Robert Daly, who's the director of the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute, rightly pointed out in a question that lurking beneath what all of our panelists and both panels, uh, what Victoria Coleman said in her keynote, what Meg King has said in her introductions, and what Cosa Spanos has said in his introductions, is this word that in the United States, everyone kind of goes, oh, shock, gasp, awe, which is industrial policy. Right, that there has to be some impetus to engage in your market. Um, and I think Eileen and Eric and Meg here have done a really good job saying, and that does not just mean high production at scale in a specific area, but really engage across the various opportunities for funding um, and across the various stages of that life cycle, meaningfully with an eye to the now and toward the future. So his question is about how do we start moving this lever on industrial policy or market craft, whichever term you would prefer, whichever is less loaded, and where are kind of the policy in your minds, um, areas where the United States could get big bang for its buck that they should maybe be kind of investing in now. And then some areas that please don't cancel this area, right? So some areas where we really like what's already happening, please don't remove it. And then one area on the other side that's sort of, let's think about this industrial policy, we need to take that call seriously. Let's go ahead and start with Eric. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and that's a great, great question. The uh, And I'm just thinking on and putting it into a policy perspective, we need marketing because some people want to do this thing called industrial policy. Other people hate to do industrial policy. And yet, if you say, well, this is what we want to do, they go, oh, yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, Dr. Coleman referenced SCC and industry collaboration and uh, I've uh, lived through the formation of Semitech, and Semitech is kind of a touchstone for industrial policy writ large, and it's got an obvious connection to the semiconductor industry. In the 30 plus years since Semitech was established, there's been a lot of academic studies on how effective it was, and I'd, I'd offer the, the jury's deadlock. It's not oh yeah, we, we should do that again, or oh no, that was a waste of, uh, in, in 1990s dollars, about a billion dollars of federal funding, and even more than that by the states of Texas and New York. And the question was, did it actually make a difference in R&D spend? Did it make a difference in results? Uh, I think Vladimir kind of touched upon it. Um, you know, if you wrote a $100 million check or gave someone $100 million of tax abatement, uh, to a major semiconductor company, would it make a material difference? Now, CEO, I'd cash the check, but I've been the CTO, and I'd note that, you know, well, that represents 0.7% of my current R&D spend. So that's not really going to move my needle much. I'll, I'll probably also take the money because the CEO will tell me to, but uh, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But that is why uh, more in the, the areas that Eileen has been talking about, that Vladimir has been talking about, and a thing that we, we did uh, work towards in the, in the prior administration is beefing up programs like Manufacture in USA, because those are kind of targeted as how do we scale those uh, Series B level companies? And by the way, $100 million to a company that's raised $10 million and is out looking for their next 50 that's material. 
Uh, I would also say, though, in terms of what works, you know, where there is broad agreement in the academic uh, community was the effectiveness of, because uh, at the same time you had Semitech, you had first the Reagan and then the Bush administration really strictly enforcing the anti-dumping laws was the issue at that time. And so I'd offer the takeaway there is, you know, even if it means a painful shot, since we're getting our COVID vaccinations, to the domestic companies, meaning you know, like sanctions on some of their customers, that you know hits us in our own pockets. But you know, that was something that uh, I think worked. We're going to go to Eileen here, and then we'll finish up with Meg on this question. Okay. Um, so, sort of one area I haven't really touched upon um, is that it's it maybe takes a little bit longer to explain, but I'll, I'll I'll try to do it quickly. Which is one of the areas that we think the U.S. should focus on is is packaging. Um, and the reason why is the following. Number one, if you move away from everything integrated in one place, which then requires all of you to do everything at TSMC, but instead come up with these 3D packaged chips, which where maybe one of the pieces needs to be state of the art from TSMC, but then the other pieces can all be made in the foundries that are all over the United States and you put them together uh, in the US. That, saw, you know, that does a couple things. Number one, it sort of gives more demands to the foundries here, lets you reutilize, reutilize capacity you already have here. Um, you might be able to put security in the packaging portion to ensure secure supply chain. So I think from an industrial policy point of view, we believe the US should focus in on packaging and should ensure that we are the leaders in packaging. And it's still a race to see uh, kind of who is going to be the leader now, I mean, maybe some might argue uh, TSMC has is, is started maybe the last five, six years, but we definitely can, can um, catch up or work with them or whomever we need to work with in order to, to really be the leaders in packaging. Um, the second part, just talking about the, the startup companies. Uh, so there's this concept of a, a multi-project wafer that most startup companies need to work on before they actually get to the final process and final design. Uh, most of the startup companies do not have access to state-of-the-art manufacturing capacity in the US to do multi-project wafers. Uh, while there is Skywater, Skywater's nodes are not the latest nodes. So most of the companies in which we invest, including the ones in some of the portfolio, venture portfolios of major companies like Qualcomm and Intel have to rely on TSMC to get these multi-pro, you know, multi-project wafers. So that, you know, how can we help our startup companies actually have that uh, here? And then finally, and I'm sure I'm a broken record at this point, it's about um, effectively maybe, you know, whenever I was investing at, at Applied, our co-investors were always Intel and Samsung, almost every every deal. You know, can you actually help, and, and Qualcomm in, in, in other cases, can you actually help those companies who are indeed putting some risk capital from an initial policy point of view, you know, match what they're doing? S since, they, the, you know, they're already looking at, at companies, they already have a good pipeline, they know which ones are probably more successful than the others, uh, you know, help match their funding into every startup that they, they back because then that has a higher chance because you can't just throw money without knowledge and expertise. So you don't want people who know nothing about semiconductors just handing out funds to startup companies, but do it in cooperation with the existing players and then create, I mean, let's just remember Applied was a startup, Intel was a startup, NVIDIA was a startup, Qualcomm was a startup. They were all startups and over the 40 years, now they've become the big cadence synopsis were startups. So, you know, let's work with them to create the next startups. And, and so I think those are the kind of my three, three suggestions. Thank you. We're yeah. going to end on this with Meg. So you get to take us home on the kind of future policy suggestions. What can we invest in now, even if we don't call it industrial policy, because we listen to Eric and we pay attention to marketing. Yeah, I know. I think um, industrial policy is like a, a third rail or a dirty word. And, and um, I, I think we should just think about it alternatively, just the way that Victoria Coleman outlined it. We need a strategy because the US government and other governments around the world are already pulling levers. Um, it's not like we're not uh, using policy related to the semiconductor industry. There's been in the past several years, a lot of trade 
levers and, and previous to that, there was CFIUS reform levers. There are a lot of levers that are being pulled, so why not do it strategically? Um, so that's that's just a comment on industrial policy. Um, we really think that in the industry that the uh, bipartisan support for chips is a huge achievement and a positive one. Um, I, I'm very much aligned with Susie Armstrong's comments on, on the need for R&D. I mean, it's just been a precipitous fall in federal R&D spending and um, it's uncompetitive and we really, really need more funding. So um, appreciate and think it's a huge achievement that we got chips authorized, but now I think we really need to see the money. And just a few little facts from the Semiconductor Industry Association study is for every dollar invested in semiconductor R&D, you get a $16.5 return in GDP over a period of years. That's huge. And, and if CHIPS does get fully funded, as described, it would create nearly half a million jobs before the end of this decade. So it is a worthwhile industrial policy to focus on semiconductors. The, the one additional suggestion um, I would like to throw out there is to go back to the 2017 PCAST report. And I think some of the speakers here were involved in, in, in that previously. Um, at one of the most interesting elements of that PCAST report was the idea of moonshots. And although you know artificial intelligence or quantum computing is never going to be as um, easy to for the American public to engage their imagination as an Apollo mission, we still can have moonshots. And the value of moonshots is it's not necessarily direct investment in the semiconductor industry, but it's direct investment in really large technology advancements that demand uh, additional research and investment in the semiconductor industry. So again, whether that is artificial intelligence or quantum computing or 5G, um, I think the US government should look at moonshots. Uh, I think that that would be a way to advance more than just the semiconductor industry. Thank you. I think in that conversation, and I appreciate all of you bringing this, there's a huge scope here in terms of the policy levers that are available to the United States government. Um, and each of those bring a lot of opportunity to sort of engage with this problem and everything from kind of the investments and where you invest those to thinking about moonshots and the framing of those um, all the way over to being really specific about actually funding your proposals uh, and putting the money in and where you get the most return on those investments. Uh, and thinking about sort of tax breaks, which I know that Eric brought up as well. So I want to take us, we have about three to four minutes for this question before we have to start wrapping up. So we'll be on strict time discipline heading forward. This is much more into the weeds, but Leland Nicholson um, has asked us, how are semiconductor chips or integrated circuits checked for security and spyware vulnerabilities? So how do we actually do that security checking um, certification in process? Um, Eric looks like he's unmuted. So why don't you start and then Meg did as well. So I'll move to Meg right after. Yeah, I mean, and the joke in the industry is, you know, the way to be sure what it is, you take the cover off and you take a picture and then you, you know, sh shred off a layer and take a picture. And at the end, you have proved that it was a good chip and you also have a pile of sand. Uh, there are a number of t uh, techniques now coming out and I'm sure Meg to talk about today, but in terms of, uh, uh, in fact, the ideas of homomorphic encryption, if you've been following the tech industry, uh, uh, which people think of, oh, that's a way to do cloud computing uh, without the cloud provider actually ever knowing what your program does. That's actually techniques uh, invented by the chip industry. Uh, the problem to solve was uh, how to not be able to figure out what a chip's doing from its noise signature, but it also made it, you can't figure out what the chip does just by looking at the, 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 you know, the patterns. And it has the benefit of if somebody puts in some extra circuitry or whatever, you immediately know it just doesn't work. Uh, I'll defer to Meg for uh, kind of more of what, that's more tomorrow, what's, what's going on today? Yeah, no, I can't, I can't speak at that level, Eric. I don't know about homomorphic encryption. I do know the government is, is putting a lot of um, effort into new technologies on, on securing um, chips. But I, I would just like to go back to the concept of a secure supply chain. And uh, again, there are some um, investments that can be made in assuring that your, your products are not sabotaged along the way. And there are um, security standards, the common criteria security standards that you can live up to and can be audited um, and bring accountability um, to, to the product itself and the integrity of the product 
add to that the really uh, huge investment in a secure supply chain, which we have had to do because we make security products. And so I don't think the only answers are technology. I think coming back to securing your supply chain is a huge element of this. Very helpful. Eileen, do yeah. you want to jump in for about a minute? Yeah, I mean, uh, I can go on a lot of uh, a long because we do invest in a lot of security at InQtel. Um, so just to answer the gentleman's question, I mean, there's everything from physically unclonable functions or puffs that are put onto chips to ensure their identity to uh, secure enclaves where certain important functions are running in only certain parts of, of the chip to, um, you know, the encryption. But, but more importantly, I think we need to look at not just the chip itself standalone, but what is happening when you start to run something on the chip and you know, we, of course, we've made investments in these areas as well. So cons consistent monitoring of what's going on while it's running um, is a program somehow causing the chip to access uh, a part, a uh, certain cache or memory or parts that it should not. Um, so, so there's uh, surprisingly, uh, you know, there's, there's actually not um, that many startups in this space just yet. Um, I'm hoping there will be. Uh, but um, th there's certainly a lot, a lot that can be done and a lot that can be borrowed from the cyber world on the software side. Uh, they just need to keep pushing it down more layers into the, uh, the, the silicon itself. And, and Melissa, Go ahead, Eric. If, if I might, uh, let me challenge Meg a little, but only a little bit, because you know, perfection is the enemy of the good. It's not to say a secure ch supply chain is important. And as we've seen with SolarWinds, with Microsoft, with Amazon, your most trusted vendors can still be compromised. And so I'd like to trust my vendors, but I truly trust in mathematics and physics. And, and, and that's why we need to keep funding Eileen startups so that we get you know, some, some good tamper-proof uh, technologies. Did you want to reply there briefly, Meg, before no, I move into No, I really don't disagree. Uh, uh, and, and when I say securing a supply chain, it includes all of the cyber defenses as, as well, Eric. And there is no perfect world, and it's a constant job. And, and um, red team, blue team within your own company, et cetera, that's all kind of standard operating procedure. So I think what's really excellent about that answer is that what you're seeing is when we talk about security, it's everything from technology-based solutions, which Eric started us off with, Eileen saying, you really need to push those cybersecurity best practices further down into the silicon, further down into the stack um, and kind of consider them further. And then also these questions of, do you trust your vendors? Are you doing this across your supply chain, which all of those feed into these questions of security. So. 30 seconds, one minute responses. We are going to close out and sort of hot seat rapid fire round um, across the three of you. We have covered in this panel a lot of policy opportunities for the United States, many, many, many. Many of our viewers are in a position to start to think about implementing some of those policy solutions that we've talked about. So I'm gonna ask each of you, and I'm gonna limit you to 30 seconds to a minute, to really quickly, if you were in a magical situation where you could snap your fingers or wave a wand, what is one investment or position or policy you would make today, one, to put us in the best position for the future, to kind of help ground our listeners on the way out the door? So 30 seconds to a minute. We will start with Meg. Um, I'm going to go with uh, uh, massive increases in research dollars. Um, look at look at what Senator Schumer is seeking to do. Um, it, again, some of it's for semiconductors and some of it is for other advanced technologies. That will ensure a high level of innovation, which keeps the US market um, leading in the world. All right, 30 seconds, Eileen. Right, so the Chips for America bill is, is a great start. Uh, the NSTC and the innovation fund that's in there um, is really good. It just needs to be broader in, in scope and scale. So today, I think there's a hundred million um, uh, there's, I think there's maybe 500 million, I think that is, although I, I just can't remember right now, um, but it's limited right now to only um, the supply chain and inspection equipment. Uh, so, so somehow that bill got very narrowed down to very specific areas. And as I've mentioned before, semiconductors is a big stack. There's a lot of venture capital amongst companies across that whole stack, including materials and equipment, and we need to expand to include that. And more importantly, you really need to help these Series B companies that are in existence today. 
uh, and that's it. Excellent. Eric, finish this out with your 30 seconds. Eight word bumper sticker, scale late stage startups so they can grow. You know, in other words, help Vladimir's bridge vision and help Eileen take her companies to the next level. Excellent. And we even got a bumper sticker out of that, which for marketing purposes will be really good for us. So in closing, as we are now at time, I want to thank all of our audience for taking the time out of, I'm sure, their very busy days to join us for this conversation. A huge thank you to all of our panelists and, of course, to our keynote, Dr. Coleman, for bringing your expertise and very thoughtful commentary on a complex and sometimes geopolitically charged topic. I want to give a big shout out to the teams at Stip and Citrus, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, without whom this event would never have taken place. Um, we hope to see all of you at future Wilson Center events. Thank you for joining us.